That has more conviction. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the April 18th Budget Commission meeting. I'm Katie Howard, the chair. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues, and uh, Retta's coming right back, so I will wait a second for, to call roll. I uh, want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, this is more of a discussion format. I'm looking forward to it and thank everyone um, in the audience as well. It's great to have you all here, stakeholders. So, um, Pierre, what else? I guess I have to wait for Retta to get back to, or can we go ahead? You have a quorum, so we can, great. We can get started. All right, well then, let's go ahead and just call roll okay. as we are. All right, awesome. Representing Education District 1 and Chair of this committee, Katie Howard. Present. Representing Education District 2, Ms. Loretta Balden. On her way back. Oh, yes. <laughs> Representing Education District at large seat 9, Ms. Jessica Johnson. Present. I also want to acknowledge our board chairs present, Ms. Erica Mitchell. We do have our uh, District 3 representative, Dr. Ken Zelf. Of course, our superintendent, uh, Dr. Battle, our general counsel, and our uh, CFO, uh, Lisa Brecken, and we have a host of other individuals at this meeting today. With that being said, Madam Chair, you do have a quorum. Great, thank you. All right, with that being taken care of, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve today's agenda? So moved. All right, all in favor? Aye. Great, we have approval of the agenda. Um, now we need to approve the minutes from our March 21st meeting. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the March 21st Budget Commission meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So moving right along to the meat of the meeting, um, we will hear from CFO Dr. Bracken. Um, if you are ready, we will go ahead with the presentation. Sure thing. All right. So we do have... So we, mm -mm, no. So we, oh, is that better? Okay, so we do have three topics today that we are going to discuss, and the clicker is also not working. Um, so we're going to start today with an overview of our special revenue account. So this is federal funds um, primarily, but we'll also be discussing some of our other grants um, that are going to be a piece of the budget. So when you do adopt the tentative budget um, in May, you will be adopting not only the general fund, but also special revenue, SPLOST, school nutrition. Um, and our student activity account. So we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to discuss all of those other pieces of the budget as well. And we'll be handing off to the experts of those areas to present those uh, budgets. Then we will close out with an in-depth uh, discussion of the general fund process, the FY2025 25 budget process so far this year. Um, we do have a balanced budget to discuss today, and this will be the budget with uh, minor adjustments that we'll be bringing for tentative, adjust, uh, for tentative adoption. And then we do have an opportunity in May at that budget commission meeting to discuss any changes that may occur between tentative and final. And so uh, we will start that conversation, but we will also use today to tee up some conversations around long-term planning and multi-year planning as well. So with that, I will hand off to our first presenter for special revenue, which is Lindsay. All right. Well, good afternoon, <coughs> members of the board. I am Lindsay Evans, the Executive Director of Federal Programs, and I am here to just provide you guys with the 25, thank you, um, projected budget for federal funds. I will start with Title I. Uh, the purpose and the scope, I will provide a quick overview of it, is to support educators in improving the academic achievement of students who are economically and educationally disadvantaged. The funds are utilized to provide evidence-based supplemental programs, services, and activities to address the needs of academically at-risk students, professional development for instructional staff, and parent and family engagement activities. I will just highlight some of the allowable use of funds and really what aligns to our budgets. Uh, we utilize the funds for materials and supplies, as well as professional development for our instructional leaders. We also um, have a, a component of the family engagement, both at the district and at the school level. 
And then also we utilize our funds for the salaries of teachers and profession, paraprofessionals. So with Title I funds, as well as the other funds, we do anticipate the funding to remain flat. It is based on the funding from the previous years. We will continue, as far as our strategies for 25, we will continue to consolidate our Title I Part A funds with state and local. Um, this allows for schools, our traditional schools, to have additional flexibility at the school level. And then we are also pushing in Title IV Part A funds which will be transferred to Title I uh, to support the increased school-based allocation. Are we changing anything um, for this upcoming year? We have increased our Title I per pupil allega uh, allocation. And then we are also excited about uh, using our funds differently. We are providing additional funds to the uh, homeless set-aside, our Title I homeless set-aside. We were purchasing additional positions. We are doing uh, transportation as well as administrative support. In addition, we are purchasing uh, attendance intervention for platform for the upcoming year. I am going to move on to Before title. Before we move on to okay. title one, I just wanted to lift up that um, there was a question around the effectiveness and how we determine the effectiveness of spending of the Title I and federal fund dollars. We do have a data strategist on our team that is um, constantly reviewing different initiatives. And if you want to speak to any of just the work that Emily does for us and some of yeah. her recommendations and how that informs how we decide to make changes to Title I allocations on an annual yeah. basis. I sure can. So Emily came to us in 2021. She was actually a fellow and she did her capstone project with federal funds and kind of the impact of that. Uh, based on that, that kind of set the groundwork for us to do a better dive or a deeper dive into the effectiveness measures. Um, we're very excited to have Emily, and this past year she um, was able to really jump in and look at our program evaluation across all of our federal funds. Um, with that being said, that's how we decided or came up with the idea of reallocating our Title IV funds to Title I to help um, increase the Title I school-based allocation. We felt like that would be a better use of funds. Thank you for that, yeah. um, and thank you for helping us pause there. I do want to allow opportunity for questions during the presentation. I know it's fairly long, and I know we need to get through sections of it. But um, seeing that we've already talked a little bit about the Title IV dollars yes. with the Title I, um, and I know you need to keep going through, but are there any questions right now? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Erica? Good afternoon. So pardon me. I'm just getting my packet and just going through as you are um, going through the presentation. I think yes. two questions that I do have. Okay. Um, you created, I mean, I'm sorry, you increased, increased Title I funding per pupil allocation. Do you have an amount what the per pupil is? Yes. Okay. So we do rank order with our Title I schools. So the schools with the highest level of poverty, which is 100%, would receive, um, they're receiving uh, $900 per pupil. Okay. As uh, compared to last year, I think it was around the $700 mark. Okay. And so, then our lowest Title I school would receive an allocation of $600 per okay. pupil. Per pupil. Yes. So that's the increase. 100% Title I will have an increase of $900. That, that will be the per pupil allocation per is $900. Allocation. In the past, it was around $770. Okay. Okay. And then the other question is, um, right under that, you mentioned um, additional uh, transportation and administrative support for a homeless population, yes. also attendance intervention. Um, you did said there were uh, creation of additional positions. How many positions were created around yeah. that? And what are, how many positions and what are the positions? Yeah, uh, they are, there are going to be two positions and it is one in transportation. So it's going to help with scheduling the transportation of our homeless population. And then the other position will uh, support student support or the um, homeless liaison as well as the foster care liaison directly. Okay. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. And I'm excited about that because it's yes. really a result of you all's board uh, meeting earlier in the year. Yes. So. Great. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you for those questions, Erica. Any others right now? All right. We'll go through the rest of the title and then we'll pause one more time. That's okay. Okay. 
Okay, so I am done with Title I. I'm going to go on to Title II. Okay, so our Title II is to improve the quality and effective use of teachers and uh, instructional leaders by providing professional opportunities, pathways, as well as utilizing funds to uh, retain highly effective teachers and leaders. The allowable use of funds, I would like to highlight, it's really all of these. So with uh, our district, we um, currently provide um, training and um, staff development. We provide professional learning both throughout the year as well as the summer. And um, we also have created pathways and we do retention, uh, or not retention, but we do hiring incentives for our um, certain teachers. And right now we have highlighted the CTAE and special ed. So that's a hiring incentive that we have put in place for the past several years. I am going to move on to the next. So like Title I, we do anticipate to remain fairly flat or stable, and um, we have built our budget based on uh, this current year allocation. Uh, our strategies for this upcoming year is to increase targeted teacher development on content, pedagogy, and student supports and interventions as just making sure that we are retaining effective teachers and leaders. There are no significant changes at this time to the budget, and um, our budget remains pretty consistent with um, the FY24 funding, and that's really because Title II supports professional learning retention of um, effective employees. Any questions regarding Title II? I say we keep moving on to Title IV, okay. and then we can ask additional questions if we have any, but thank you. Yes. All right, Title IV. The purpose of Title IV is to provide all students with access to a well-rounded education, improve school conditions for student learning, and improve effective use of technology in the classroom. The allowable use of funds that I would like to highlight, because this is really what we're leveraging our funds for next year, is the safe and healthy schools. So it's uh, relating to activities, creating a safe uh, and supportive learning environment for students. This allocation is going to remain um, consistent. And um, our strategies for this year are providing funding for district-wide programming, including the Cultural Experience Project, which are student field trips, multi-tiered system of supports, and summer school academic enrichment pro uh, programs. A portion of Title IV Part A funds will be transferred to Title I to increase the school-based allocation. We are no longer consolidating Title IV because we feel like uh, the middle school behavior and summer bridge initiatives have been mm -hmm. or have proven to be ineffective. So we have reallocated those um, funds. Are we using the funds differently? We are purchasing the uh, attendance intervention and we are actually braiding these funds with Title I. So what we will do is we will pay for the Title I schools out of Title I and then the non-title schools will be out of um, Title IV. So it's just a way for us just to leverage our federal funds and maximize the dollars. We're also adding additional multi-tiered system of support positions. I do, and I asked a question about not doing the middle school um, behavior support uh -huh. and understanding that those, that those funds can shift. Um, how is the district providing support to our schools around things that you know we have seen have an impact because we know this is an area of great need, behavioral supports for um, students in middle school level. Um, do you all have any idea you know, what that will look like going forward? Do appreciate that this was evaluated and determined that it's not been working best, but how are we going to make sure we have something that is? As far as funding, us reallocating it to Title I still allows schools, if they have found the middle school behavior initiative or bridge effective, they still have the fi um, Fund 150 funds to uh, still support those initiatives. Um, as far as federal funding, we um, also are really honing in on making sure that these funds are, are being utilized to um, best support the students' needs at that particular school. So with this initiative, it was pretty restrictive. It either had, the funds either had to be used for the middle school initiative or for the um, summer bridge. Now that it's being leveraged in Title I, schools have the flexibility to utilize those funds. 
And how will we be measuring and yes. monitoring the impact of the funds that schools will have and some autonomy, which makes sense, but to make sure that it's having an impact in this area? So we will do a annual program evaluation. That's what our data strategist will do at the district level. And then she will also um, hone in on some data at the school level. Um, we also at the I have specialists and each of them um, perform monitoring reviews twice a year. And that uh, allows us to make sure that they are truly aligning their consolidated funds to their continuous improvement plan, as well as their strategic plans. So that's something that we do twice a year. And um, it's in collaboration with uh, the continuous improvement team, as well as school turnaround. Great, that's really helpful. I'm actually thinking about um, our goal around profile of the graduate and making sure our students have life skills, and this definitely ties into that work. So looking forward to hearing data on that, and I know questions around me, Jessica? And thank you. Um, to follow up to Board Member Howard's question, is that same kind of level of and frequency of monitoring happening with thir the third party contractors um, that you mentioned, I guess it probably uh, under the Title I bucket? So we currently really do not have any third party uh, vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just an allowable use of funds. Okay. Uh, yes. So currently we do not have that. Okay. But if that was the case, we would be monitoring them. Okay. That's helpful. And so I would love a little more context, maybe just around like the summer summer bridge piece and just why why it was ineffective. And I, heard, I understand that, that schools can use funds if they should choose to, but are we offering any additional resources to replace that, that kind of critical juncture? So uh, the Title IV funds that were allocated, and they were actually consolidated into traditional schools as well as non-traditional um, uh, schools um, budgets, they, they will be able, able to leverage uh, the consolidated funds to still, still support this if this is something that they found effective. But based on our program evaluation, and I can provide you guys with a summary of our report if you guys would like it. it, it yeah, I was going to say it's pretty detailed with the data, and it shows that a lot of our non-traditional schools did not spend the money, and that was pretty consistent. So that was our charter partner <clears throat> schools. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Aretta? Um, because you, the the statement I heard was it was ineffective, not necessarily everywhere, but it was ineffective. Um, but I believe that there there is some effectiveness there. So within that report, does it identify anyone who did do it effectively? Yes. And are there learnings that can be applied in terms of how can you turn something that is perceived as ineffective to actually be effective? Um, because that is a, a critical program. It is a, a critical transition. Um, and there is a belief that it's important. So I definitely have an appetite for, for the, the details around that okay. in terms of how does it become more effective. So if those dollars are going, again, directly to the school and they have a, the autonomy to do what's going to be most impactful to their school, I want to make sure that they're armed with um, some research-based um, success. Yes, I definitely can. I have been in contact with the director of after school and he actually supports this initiative. It has, uh, it, so it's something that we have been talking about and I will definitely share this information with him as well as um, the schools. So the takeaway for uh -huh. me shouldn't be that bridge is going away, but it's going to be, they're going to be given the dollars to make that transition more impactful locally. Is that correct? Yes, it okay. is. It's it's not necessarily the ineffectiveness of the program. It was the ineffectiveness use of the funds. Okay. Yes. Yes. So thank you for that. Thank and I'll you. just uh -huh. add, kind of reiterate what Lindsay was saying around when it was a if it is a district led initiative and we're earmarking the funds for that purpose and schools aren't using them, that is a waste of those funds. And so by redistributing the same funds back out to schools where schools were leveraging those funds for that purpose successfully, there, you shouldn't feel a change. But the schools that were not using them to begin with now can apply them to things that they are finding effective in, in their schools. And so it's a better usage of the dollars overall without us saying you can't do that program. 
So. And on that, I know Ken has a question, okay. um, but real quickly on this piece, you know, really like Aretha's saying, digging into what was not working and what is, so we can maybe even, because we're hearing a lot of feedback of middle schoolers needing this provided way in advance of the bridge, like getting ready for high school, like in sixth grade. So how we're really leaning in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, that requires us to do an analysis of what has not been done properly. That's not to say, as y'all are saying, it, it's needed, but we need to do it differently or make sure there's fidelity around its implementation because um, we definitely don't want to waste any federal dollars on the space where we have needs. Mm -mm. Sorry, Ken. Yeah, th thanks for that. And kind of picking up on that, our, across all our federal funds, are we are, are there any corrective actions? Are we in compliance? Is there any issues that the feds have raised that we need to be concerned about as we head into the budget for next year? At, not at this point. We are actually going to participate in a cross-functional monitoring in the upcoming weeks. So at that time, I will um, let you know. And, and, and building up that, are there any dollars, and I think I think Dr. Bracken mentioned this a little bit, uh, are there any dollars that we're at risk of returning back to the feds because we have not, we have unspent them and missed the, and the, the, the deadline has lapsed? So not underneath my tutelage, but I just started this year. So <laughs> I am a true advocate of spending all of our funds and I will uh, figure out a way. So currently, no, we're on track to expend our funds. Our, all our, all across all our federal funds? Yes. Thank you. And I, I will just remind us that we actually do leverage the federal um, calendar for our funds. So you'll see some funding here, we're about to cover ESSER, that we are earmarking for next year because it will be spent in this fiscal year, but the federal fiscal year, which ends September 30th. So we will spend all of the dollars that might not be June 30th for our fiscal year, but it will be in the compliance of the grant, which is September 30th. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. um, moving along. Yes, Esser. Esser. So Esser, we are in our final year of Esser, and the purpose of Esser was to provide all students with uh, pre prevention and protection during the pandemic time. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, schools are kept safe and funds were used to address any disruptions to learning as a result of the pandemic. An overview of the allowable activities, and I'm just kind of highlighting the ones that we uh, can currently align our funds to is we um, have done a really good job of purchasing supplies to sanitize and clean facilities throughout the years. We have um, purchased educational technology. We have provided mental health services and supports, as well as um, implemented summer learning uh, that, <clears throat> that was previously funded uh, last year with ESSER 3 This year, we will be leveraging Title I as well as general funds. And then also just uh, helping with school uh, facility repairs and improvements. So the SR decreased annually based on the actual spend. And as I previously stated, we are in the final year of the grant. It sunsets September 30th, and we are on track to expend 100% of our funds. This budget was created uh, because uh, with federal funds, it's a 15-month cycle, and we do need to have an operating budget for the first three months. So that would be July through September. The purpose of this is to close out any expenditures that we currently have on the books, as well as uh, just uh, submit final reimbursements for our charter partner schools or close out on any facility or operations. So that that's how we uh, created the budget. And that is it for me as far as ESSER. Um, I say keep moving. We have any other questions? You have a question, Jessica? Yeah. Yes. Just want to clarify, and I know we, we asked maybe a month ago, are we on track to spend down the remainder of those funds, I guess, by September at this, at this juncture? We are. We've been very intentional with making sure that we are uh, keeping our eye on the pulse. So we uh, swept any additional funds at the school level as far as like non-personnel and travel uh, so we could leverage them at the district level to ensure that we are not giving back any money. And we have a long wish list we that we are constantly booking against um, as needs arise if we do see that there's any areas where we've budgeted and have an underspend. And so 
that uh, can help free up some of the general fund dollars. Yep. And I had asked some questions just about, you know, things we are keeping that we had paid for with ESSER funds, and I appreciate the answer I got. And one of them was around AVA um, and filling the gap for 10 teacher vacancies um, and continuing that level of support for schools and in-person learning. So I know you all have already done a lot of work in shifting. So thank you. So I think that's the last slide for Lindsay. It is. Any other questions? And then we'll hand off. So thank you, are, Lindsay. All right, thank you. Moving to preschool, federal preschool. Good afternoon, board and our superintendent. My name is Imandia Ford. And oh, thank you. And I serve as executive director of special education here for the best school district in the metro area. I, um, I'm going to review several budgets with you today, um, beginning with federal preschool, which is 2404, also our state preschool, um, our special education parent mentor, IDEA flow through, as well as IDEA disproportionality. So I'll be reviewing a total of five budgets. Our preschool budget, um, the purpose of it is for us to educate our students and to um, conduct child find activities for students preschool age children two and a half to five years old. Um, primarily, this budget funds salaries for paraprofessionals, um, provides instructional supplies, professional technical services for teachers, testing material, office supplies, and um, federal indirect costs. Um, the scope um, in general is what I just described, is that we want to be able to educate our students and provide high quality programming for positive outcomes for preschool children um, in the area of early language and literacy, as well as social, emotional, and adaptive. Allowable use, usage of um, these funds are for child find, as mentioned previously, um, salaries, community awareness, instructional materials, and um, proportionate share. Um, we are projecting approximately a 4% increase, and this is due to carryover funds. These um, carryover funds are there because we are in the process of increasing the proportionate share activities that we provide and support we provide to our private school and homeschool students. So we did not use that entire amount. We, are, we have more efforts for reaching out, communicating with them, and locating these children to see what services and supports are needed so that we can anticipate utilizing these funds in the upcoming school year. The next budget um, is our state preschool, which is um, 2561. And let me, what did I do with the clicker? Oh, I've got it. Oh, oh, Lisa, oh you. thank you. I snuck over there. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So um, these funds, again, are utilized um, very similar to the previous um, budget, and that is for the um, child find for ages two and a half through five years old. And we utilize um, this funding to ensure that preschool age children are afforded the opportunity to receive services in their least restrictive environment, um, as well as addressing quality programming for them for outcomes um, in early language literacy, social emotion, and adaptive. Um, we utilize these again for the child find activities, teachers, parents, community awareness, and instruction for students. Okay. We do not anticipate um, any um, any significant changes. The 7.5 increase that appears here is strictly um, due to the increase in salaries and benefits. Right. 2512 is um, our special education parent mentor. We are provided with um, part of a portion of the salary. Um, to be able to provide part-time um, parent mentors, and we um, subsidize the amount so that we can have two. So we have actually two um, parent mentors 
who are um, who are part time that support our district. And these individuals provide support to our parents and helping to educate them um, on IDEA, help to find community resources. Um, they work collaboratively with the Title I um, parent liaisons in the building. And so um, we are very excited to have two um, finally on board. We've worked very diligently for many years to try to um, recruit and retain two, but we've only had one great one who retired, and now we have two phenomenal ladies who support the parents in our district. Okay. All right. Our IDEA flow through budget. Um, we um, always anticipate this budget being flat, and so we plan in accordance. Um, the use of this um, funding is primarily for positions. We have approximately 45 teachers, um, 44 paras, um, 29 bus monitors, um, a director, three coordinators, two data specialists, and um, we use the remaining um, amount that we have to subsidize for the parent mentors. We also utilize this to fund it, as well as an assistant and therapist and a student success coach. So this fund is, is primarily utilized to educate students with disabilities, and we um, utilize it for salaries. Okay. As stated previously, we always anticipate that it remains flat. However, we do know that it could go up or down. It could be increased or decreased. Um, and there are no changes for this budget for the upcoming year. Budget 2728 is also an IDEA budget, but it is utilized for disproportionality purposes. And the primary um, usage of this is 15% of our IDEA funds, and that's to mitigate disproportionate practices. Um, right now, we are primarily focusing on over-identification of students with disabilities, as well as um, the disproportionate um, or discrepancy around the over-suspension of students with disabilities. So we have um, utilized this funding to um, to employ for the upcoming year nine disproportionality specialists, um, five um, inclusive practices specialists, as well as one coordinator. And these individuals, again, will help to support schools in mitigating those disproportionate, disproportionate practices. This budget is decreasing, and it, in, and it is due to a reduction in the carryover funds. And so we have had a, redu um, a slight reduction in positions um, on this budget for the upcoming year. Um, however, there are no, um, no additional changes. We had to just, we had a reduction due to um, the decrease in our carryover. I'll pause real quickly. Is that impacting these services? Well, it is, we, at this time, we are actually reviewing the effectiveness of the services that are being provided, and we are redefining how the student support disproportionality specialists are supporting the schools. Um, their work is primarily around behavior um, by serving as check and connect mentors, as well as supporting the MTSS process. So for the last several years, they have really been supporting um, tier two. And now we are going to look at them supporting more in tiers two and tiers three based on the school's needs. And so this is primarily based on what supports are needed around MTSS that may be causing the over-identification. So we did have to reduce the number of those student support disproportionality specialists. Um, we'll have nine. Um, this year there were 15 or 16. We were not able to fill out of those positions. There were a few vacancies. Um, so we, were, um, we had to abolish six positions Four of those were people, and we'll have nine for the upcoming year. How do we feel about having nine versus 15? I feel like we're going to be okay because one of the proposed changes that we're exploring is not having them support just one school. So initially in the original plan several years ago when I, we developed the plan, we had them um, supporting two schools depending on the size and the need, and then we pivoted and decided to just have them support one school. Well, for the upcoming year, we are exploring having them support two schools. So instead of there being um, 14 or 15 schools supported, we'll be looking at approximately 18 because we have nine people and all of those positions are filled. And I know we could have a separate work session on this area mm -hmm. alone, which we can one day. Um, but 
in terms of equity and need, like mm -hmm. how will that be evaluated as the year goes on and like pivoting and adjusting based on if there's a higher disproportionality at a certain mm -hmm. school or you're seeing that, I mean, are you gonna have the people to be able to adjust? Right, we will have the people to be a, be able to adjust. Um, we don't necessarily see with this MTSS process and addressing disproportionality um, significant change mid-year. So if we were to propose changes, we would like to be able to do them for the following school year. So we'll utilize the data that we have to assign those individuals to support. However, if there is no need and we need to pivot and place that person elsewhere, we have that flexibility. Thank you. Any other questions, Azaria? Yes. Yeah, Aretta. Hello, thank you so far for the information you provided. My first question is um, from slide 16, when you were talking about this, the SPED parent mentor. So you said two part-time, does that equate to one full-time? Um, instead of doing the, um, because part-time can work up to 30 hours a week, it was more beneficial for us to do two part-time people so that we could have them for more time. If we had one person, that would be a 40-hour week. Two people, those are 30-hour weeks. So that gives us more time with those individuals. And those are two people for the entire, the entire district? Yes. And before we had? One. Many years ago, well, we had we'll say two. you had 40 hours before, but now you have up to 60 hours. Yes. And, and, and previously, that person gave us probably way more than what um, what she you know was allowed to do. She really volunteered a lot of time, um, but that was also a thirty hour position and one person. And we had the allotment for an additional one. However, we could not find anyone that was qualified that was willing to take the job. We posted it. We worked um, with DOE. We worked with some other parent groups to try to get it advertised, and we were not able to get anyone. We had people to come in and interview, but they did not meet the criteria. So um, we were finally able to get two people on board. Okay, definitely curious about this, but I will not spend time in the Budget Commission digging deeper into this role, but glad to see it. My next question is on slide eight. E, no, slide, where is it? It's still preschool. Where's the preschool question? Okay, going back. Slide 12. You said something that um, I need a little bit more information on. You said private school and homeschool. So can you talk a little bit more about Atlanta Public Schools' responsibility to private school and homeschool students within this space? Yes, we are um, required to offer private and homeschool um, students services through special education. And so um, historically, a lot of districts have just offered um, speech. If students required speech in those private settings or if they were homeschooled and they provide, um, required that service, we've been able to provide that to them. However, um, we've not been able to utilize the funding because every child does not require speech. Um, so we have been reaching out, having um, meetings, sending letters. Um, we are required to um, have child find activities to try to figure out what other needs are the, the schools may have. So that could be professional learning for the teachers. That could be some additional services and supports to students. Um, we are trying to um, customize those needs, and we're getting feedback from the private schools and um, homeschool providers to see how we can better support them in the upcoming year. And that's up to this budget that's allocated, mm -hmm. but we have not spent this entire budget in the past? No, we've not spent the entire budget for just for proportionate share. So okay. there's a certain percentage that has to be spent based on the number of students that are identified in the private schools and as well as a homeschool list that, um, that we pull from a, a state report. We are required to spend a certain amount of money. And so because that has really just been speech services, we've not been able to, to spend as much. So now we're trying to figure out how, what other ways we can support these providers and students in the private and homeschool communities. And you did say that that does not include charter schools. That would be a different allocation. No, it does not. Okay. And let's see, I think that might be it for me for now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How much, uh, uh, how much, and maybe this is a question for Dr. Bracken, how much, how much um, encroachment on, on the general fund budget do, does special ed provide? How, how much, how much pain, how much, how much are we feeling now in the general fund budget? 
So general fund also picks up a significant amount of special education funding, but we do, we do receive some state funding. We know that states offset by a, a significant amount. But um, our overall special ed funding, I think, was 24. I'll have to pull up what that is. But it is a significant so, investment okay. so, as well. So I'm just trying. And so we're paying disproportionality. We're basically just just so I understand, and so folks watching understand. We we pay that because we are over disciplining kids with IEPs. Is that is that why we have? Is that is that is that the consequence? Currently, we are not um, di significantly disproportionate for over suspension. We were, and we exited that status. Currently, we are significantly disproportionate for over identification okay. of students with disabilities. So, so mm -hmm. we're, we're charged $2 million. We're setting aside $2 million because we're over identifying kids. Correct. For, and so that and, and so that effectively comes out of the general fund. I know we're doing a special uh, I know we're doing an audit of, 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 of special education services. Will, will this be a, will this practice and this opportunity be part of that? Um, I have not been asked specific questions around disproportionality. Okay, so I do have numbers for us, and I was way off. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, so for FY 2024, we actually invested about $95 million for special education in the general fund, and that is going up to about $101 million. So for the FY 2025 budget year, it's about a $5.7 million increase. And, and tying that to this previous conversation, we are over-identifying kids for special ed, and then the bill comes for that in the form of, of encroachment on the general fund. Um, around the identification, I'm not, I'd have to get a little bit more information on that, but we do see that increase over the way that we see it or the way that, you know, I catch um, that, in, I don't know if it's encroachment, but that increase over time. We talked a little bit about this when we were talking about EIP and gifted, that sniff test we do around our local supplement to the state and just making sure that we're supplementing fairly or equitably across all of our programs. And we do see the investments that we're making from our local dollars really increasing proportionately over the years as compared to what was our local investment as compared to QBE previously. So that has been a growing increase over time. Jessica. Thank you. Um, and so I'm, I am glad to hear that we're no longer on the list for discipline because I think um, over identification or um, for discipline measures, but I see here on slide 21 that you were, um, your strategy for FY25 is to um, provide more preventive measures for discipline. And so just curious as you're talking about individuals um, kind of taking on two schools now, how are there other resources that we could pull from to make sure that we are we're able to really address that effectively with the preventive measures? Because I think that's another area that we're hearing a lot from families. Right. So one uh, point of clarity is that in order to be significantly disproportionate, you have to be the disproportionate for three consecutive years. So although we've exited the discipline status for significant disproportionality, we are still discrepant. There is still some disparities in over suspension of students with disabilities, right? Um, with that, um, those supports that we provide through those student support disproportionality specialists are not the only discipline supports that are provided in the district. We also have um, behavior technicians. We have B CBAs, we have autism specialists, um, and that's both. Um, we have general, we have general education support around behaviors as well as special education support. So, and that's by way of, of people, human resources, professional learning, um, and of course, monitoring the data because that kind of informs us on where the work is needed. Mm -hmm. All right. So we keep moving into pre-K. Is that next? Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Battle, community at large. I am Joy Bradley, Director of our Early Learning Programs, and I will present today the budgets that support our pre-K programs, starting with the first pre-K lottery. Um, this budget is funded through our Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning for all 57 pre-K classrooms. This is primarily used for the salaries and benefits for our pre-K lead and assistant teachers, as well as operations for our pre-K program. 
And other examples include classroom materials, field trips, recruitment, transition efforts, as well as um, nutrition. This budget for the upcoming school year will remain flat and there will be one significant change as we will level our program and shift one of the two classrooms from Usher Collier Elementary to Mary Lynn Elementary. Again, I wanted to um, point out that funding is based on enrollment, uh, teacher cred credentials, as well as the program type. The next budget um, presenting is through our head partnership with Greater Atlanta's YMCA through the federal funding of the Office of Head Start. And the purpose of this grant is, of course, to provide comprehensive wraparound services for 19 pre-K sites within the district. These funds are primarily used for, a large percentage of it is used for salary and benefits for our family support specialists, as well as classroom operating expenses, and then the comprehensive services that's provided to our families. For next school year, this is projected to remain flat and there will be no changes to our Head Start grant. Our United Grant, United Way Grant, I'm sorry, provides for the efforts of our citywide collaboration that's referred to as PACT. And PACT stands for the Promise All Atlanta Children Thrive, which was established in 2018. And this grant is used for primarily school transition and the early learning efforts for families of children ages birth to three um, as identified by PACT. This includes, and funds are primarily used for our transition, uh, kindergarten transition mini grants, our summer program kinder camp, as well as birth to three initiatives that are part of this salary. I'm sorry, that are a part of this funding. And then a large portion of this is to include the salary of our early learning transition specialist. And again, this budget will remain flat and there will be um, no changes to this grant. However, there are gonna be some increase of initiatives throughout the city of Atlanta. Turn on my microphone. <laughs> so I would like to address percep the perception of what I see on the screen, and I would like you to add some facts and reality to this. So looking at moving an Usher Collier class to Mary Lynn, the perception is we're moving it from an area of need to an area that, that may not have need. So the perception is wealth and resources may exist in this space and maybe not necessarily here. And Usher Collier is, um, currently I believe doing pretty good. And so my question is, how is this gonna impact the Usher Collier community um, seeing this, this roster shift? Thank you for asking that question. And so um, this was determined based on enrollment. And so we have two agencies that we have to remain compliant at Usher Collier. And so Usher Collier is funded by Georgia Pre-K as well as our Head Start program. And so currently we're under enrolled um, at 50%. And so to ensure that we're at capacity, we will have one classroom at Usher Collier to maintain the 20 students. And we found um, that there was a, a demand for um, class, a pre-K class at Mary Lynn to, to serve that community, we address that concern. So under, understanding that, mm -hmm. um, also just wanna add a, a point of view that some parts of town don't have a problem communicating what their needs are mm -hmm. and other parts of town do. And so is that unenrollment due to the fact that there is no need or is it due to the fact of a lack of engagement and appreciation for the services? Well, I would say it's twofold. So we have done um, 
and increase of recruitment efforts, but it's difficult to find the four-year-olds in, in certain areas. And so what we're doing now is trying to leverage different activities for children in those communities where there's low enrollment. And so now we're working on a learning spaces program to serve the, the Ushakaya area for those that maybe three and don't have any access to high quality preschool. And so we'll have programs in place for those communities that are under enrolled or may not have access to high quality programs. So it sounds like you're looking at using other resources for that engagement? Yes. And learning spaces is not a five day a week situation, right? It's like it is. a one day pop in type of scenario. So we're looking at two days um, starting out small, but if there is a demand, we will try to move at least to three to five days, even considering a Saturday program. Okay. I just want to make sure that the, the lack of students and seats is not perceived as a lack of need. And there's a need throughout our entire city. Exactly. Yes. And we, we see it when kids show up for kindergarten and they're not prepared. Um, so I, that's just my push in this space um, is the perception, again, is that we're moving from a place where we know there are needs to a place where the perception isn't that there are a lot of needs. Thank you for there sharing. There might be a lot of wants, but not necessarily a lot of needs. Yes. Did I answer your question? Okay. And yeah, and mine were along the same lines. Um, it's good to see the increase in the number of students enrolled in pre-K, but I went through the pre-K ambassador training, which was awesome. Thanks, Thank you, Gears, one of our great partners, Impact. Um, and a lot of the feedback from people working in these spaces um, in early learning centers throughout the city, as you know, is one of the barriers is um, parents not being able to afford if there's not a free offering of aftercare. So how we're identifying as a district things that are keeping people um, from enrolling their children in pre-K. And you just shared that part of the funding is associated with the number of students. So that's potentially us not having as much money for pre-K, but how we're getting creative. And I absolutely hear you on creating a learning space to get people just to understand the importance of early education. Um, but really wanna hear more, and I know this is not the time and space as to what we're doing as a district um, to increase our enrollment in early learning because we all know it greatly impacts um, students learning or reading on grade level and learning by third grade. So um, I did ask questions around our enrollment right now and I see that we have openings at Miles Payton and Usher mm -hmm. Elementary. So do you want to hear maybe you know follow up from us or to us from this meeting um, what we're doing right now to specifically get more students into those spaces. But appreciate all the work and the work with our partners, but know there's always more to do. Um, any other questions around pre-K? Anybody? Um, and I'll forward this on to you all as well, because I asked about um, which locations have Head Start, and it's great that we have so many that do. All right. So that concludes our presentation from our special revenue. If you guys want to hang out, you can. Otherwise, run. Um, <laughs> so uh, we will transition to our next big buckets, which is SPLOST and then also um, our school nutrition. So I think SPLOST is up next. Do you want me to advance slides? Or? Okay. All right. So I'll hand it off to our facilities team. All right, good, a good afternoon, board members. Um, I'm Dan Drake, a Senior Executive Director of Facilities. Um, want to talk to you about the uh, capital programs. We have SPLOS. Um, there are actually three separate funds, SPLOS 4, SPLOS 5, and SPLOS 6. Um, SPLOS is the, we are very, very fortunate to have the SPLOS funds, which is the special purpose local option sales tax. It's a one cent sales tax on all retail purchase in DeKalb County and Fulton County and Atlanta Public Schools gets their share. Um, that means that visitors also contribute to the support of local schools. You'll see that we'll have SPLOS 12, which was the one penny sales tax that was collected over the five year period of July 2012 through June of 17. SPLOS 17 is the five year period of sales tax one penny collections 
collected from July 17th through June 2022. And then the current uh, collections of SPLOS 2022, which is started in July 2022 and will, co and will continue through July, uh, June of 27. Um, the funds from one from from each of these three SPLOS funds cannot be commingled with each other, which is why we're reporting them separately. Uh, the SPLOS funding can be used for capital expenditures, if that includes construction renovation to instructional administrative facilities, infrastructure, HVAC, uh, athletic facilities. In addition to facilities, it can be also be used for vehicle replacements and technology improvements. Again, all capital. Uh, purchases in those. Um, so the first one is uh, Fund 354. So 354 is also referred to as SPLOS 4 or SPLOS 2012. We have, we're finally uh, ramping down. We have $1.39 million left. With the completion of the Spentine Elementary School, we will have by the, by next year, we'll hopefully be down to zero at uh, for SPLOS 4. Next one is Fund 355 or SPLOS 5 or SPLOS 17. We are in year eight of this, pro of this where the first one is in 17. Um, we have $64.9 million for capital construction, or actually for all SPLOS. 32 of that will be used for, to finish out our capital construction. Another 32 million will be used for COPS payments for the North Atlanta High School. Um, in fact, our first um, principal payment of $22 million will be paid out of SPLOS 17 of this coming fiscal year, fiscal year 25. It's our first capital expenditure. I'm sorry, it's our first principal payment. We've been paying interest over these years. Um, the next one is SPLOS 356. And that's our current SPLOS. And you can tell this is a lot larger. We're talking... $303 million of 301.9 that's shown on the screen uh, does not include the 1.8 million of, of personnel expenditures. Um, and so 278 of that will be for capital and construction and then uh, 23 million again for that same debt services for the uh, the COPS payment for the North Atlanta High School that was uh, that bond payment that COPS was taken out in 2012. Uh, this is FY25 will be our third year of collections for SPLOS 2022. Uh, that, of that 303, 164 million it is, is from our beginning collections and 140 million will be for new revenue collected over next uh, fiscal year. Next slide. And then the last fund is Fund 300, which is a relatively new fund that was developed in FY 2023. Because in prior years, the Georgia Department of Education reimbursements were going to SPLOS 17. This is now a separate fund, Fund 300, where all of the reimbursements that we get from the state for our, our capital funds um, are now funneled into Fund 300, which is being used for elevator modernizations, exterior painting, um, HVAC upgrades. You can see lots of facility improvements that we are able to do with these funds. Next slide. Uh, for next year, with we will have a, a starting balance and a, available funds of $2.2 million. Again, used for those 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 very uh, similar items. And then that $2.2 million is all is, is our expected rollover from FY24. That concludes um, the four funds, the, the three SPLOS, and the one fund 300 for capital. Questions? Aretta would like to start and then... Thank you very much. So I think I have three questions. One for the um, North Atlanta principal, not principal payment. After those two payments, what would be remaining um, in that? I'm going to have to get you the exact amount. It's it's we the the total principal payment is seventy two million dollars. Right. So this would be the first, the 22, then there'd be two $25 million payments that would be done in fiscal year 26 to 27. Okay. And then mm -hmm. over those period, all of the, the principal payments are being paid out of SPLOS 2022. The first portion of it will be paid out of 17. 
and then the remaining portion of that cap of the principal payments will be out of 2022. So um, by the end of fiscal year 27, we will be done with that and it will be fully paid out of by both SPLOS 17 and 2022. And then time for renovations, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then so my next question around um, Fund 300. So elevator modernizations, thank you, because it seems like we still have some schools with problems with elevators. Are we still waiting on parts? Yes, elevators are, we are, it is not a fun business to be in working with elevators right now. So it's, so is this modernization going to remove this challenge of waiting for these old parts because our elevators will be up, up to date? Like Hollis still is having problems with an elevator. It's been more than one year and that they've got to shuttle kids in a, you know, a, a, a car to, to move floors. So is that going to help with this? This, this will, this will, well, the, the Hollis, some of these are being paid out of, out of SPLOST. Um, but some of these other ones that we don't have allocated funds will be able to, this will be a, a pot that will be able to use to for elevator modernizations for, for uh, schools like Hollis. So this may not be the, uh, the appropriate venue, but if I can turn the heat up on that, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll get just a status update on Hollis. And then my last question is, it seems like there may be some overlap with this fund and what we could possibly spend around the ESSER or, or COVID dollars, like HVAC upgrades. Have we used all, allocated everything that we can towards those funds in terms of HVAC upgrades? Anything that could be spent there, is, has that been done, maximized? Yes, so we actually did spend quite a, a quite a bit of our ESSER funding, especially the first two rounds on uh, HVAC and different things when our facilities and some of the roll in to the general fund this year is maintaining some of those HVAC um, investments that we made. I think, uh, Thank you. So I think this is more of uh, new units or replacement units versus what the general fund picks up, which is all of the maintenance around our existing units. Am I it's a yeah. combination of combination both. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Drake. I know this is a, a massive, uh, a massive building, a building set of building projects. So can you can you address? We hear a lot about inflation, costs of projects going up. How much pressure has that put on your your project list? And should parents and community hold, the community expect to see less come out of uh, uh, these last few SPLOS investments? Well, we've spent the last six months being very proactive on that very question. Um, luckily, we've we've got two things that are happening at the same time. We have that substantial inflation that happened in starting in um, 2022 and then it's in 2023 and it slowed down a little bit in 24 slowed down a little the second half of 23 and 24 but luckily for us we've also had an increase of, of our sales tax revenues so we've um in the last six months have gone through done cost estimates for all of our projects and we've to date have had to put one project on hold which is our uh, facilities improvements project our facilities service center project um, and then if, if the revenues keep up, we believe we'll be able to take that project back on, back off hold. But we've had substantial increases on, on all of our projects and a lot of our major projects. We've provided the funds thanks due to those increased revenues that we've had on the sales tax side. If, I'm sorry, if I could okay. just add, put, a, put a little bit finer point on it, on that particular topic. Um, we have seen about a 40% year over year construction increase the last couple of, you know, over the last couple of years, 40% um, over what we've, what we originally estimated our projects at. And for many of you, you know that we estimate project cost three or four years prior to entering into the, the SPLOS cycles and actually accomplishing or to start accomplishing the work. Um, but as Dan indicated, if there is a silver lining in our in our current economic times with with these high inflationary increases, 
it means we get a little bit more um, in our splash collections. But what we're getting, the little bit more that we're getting above and beyond what we projected does not fully cover the 40% increase that, we, that, we've in, um, that we're experiencing. So I just want to make sure folks understand that and understand that, that we still may be in a situation at some point where we can accomplish all of the projects that we originally listed in our, um, the current SPLOS referendum. Jessica. Thank you so much for that. That, that definitely gives a, a good perspective of, of where we are. Um, I'm looking at slide 30, um, 33 with the Fund 300 capital improvement. And so I see a, a lot of great areas that we're looking to lean into, but I just want to lift up one area of concern that we're hearing from um, students particularly and wondering, is, is there a consideration or a timeline for like the bathroom renovations um, in a number of our schools? There's a lot of disrepair. Um, from what I'm understanding, and students are not as comfortable, and there may be some equity challenges there. So just wondering if there's a space for us to start considering how to how to work in like the bathroom renovations. Um, bathrooms are challenges across all districts because um, kind of the privacy and um, you know the activities and and they're ripe for abuse, if you will. Um, but certainly, um, we, we, we hear the same thing. Um, I talk to my counterparts across the metro and even across the um, United States, and um, bathrooms are a challenge for us, for us all. Um, but we, we hear you, and um, we'll do our best to, to, you know, to, to, to try to dedicate additional funding. Um, I think there is one bit, additional bit of um, information that I'll offer to the board um, with respect to context. Um, you know, looking at what we receive in SPLAS, $500, $600 million seems like a lot of money, and it, and it is a lot of money. Um, when we went into this current um, SPLAS cycle, our deferred maintenance at the time was estimated at about $1.5 billion. So $600 million towards $1.5 billion, you know, we're really only accomplishing about a third of what truly needs to be done. Um, so when, you, when we start asking about prioritization and things of those, you know, those, that nature, um, you know, we've... We try to focus on the building envelope, making sure that you know that the areas are dry, got electricity, those sorts of things. So some of the other things that, that you all hear about, um, play fields, parking lots, those sorts of things are, are really for us from a priority standpoint, our second tier. Um, you know, and, and we know that they need attention, but when you, when you don't have enough money to address the needs um, or all of the needs, then we obviously have to prioritize. And we try to prioritize in a way to deal with things that would, if they're not working, would impact the educational environment severely as opposed to some of the other things. So. Just, just a little bit of context. We often have these conversations with folks about, you know, how do you prioritize? Um, what's first? What's second? Um, so I just wanted to offer that to to the board and to the community at large. Um, and it, it's 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 a constant reprioritization. Those are constant efforts that we that we go through. No, I I think we definitely all appreciate that and the work you all do. Um, and when I think about it as facilities master planning and how we really align that with our programs and our student experience, understanding the realities for our system and that we are spread very thin. Um, but that's a conversation to come and something for the board to think about. So being very honest about what is really happening and what are our priorities around student experience. Mm -hmm. um, and also I'd asked about the costs that we spend on vacant property and looking at you know, the properties we've deemed excess and being able to make those productive spaces that benefit the community 
I mean, right now we spend 1.13, um, 1.1 million, correct? Got all my glasses on. That's um, correct. <laughs> sorry. But yeah, I mean, there, there's a cost to that um, too. And that's not the largest cost, but it's still a reminder that, you know, us releasing properties for productive uses um, that are appropriate. Um, so we can focus on students and their needs and our buildings is extremely important. Um, appreciate y'all's work in this space and I look forward to us having a facilities master planning retreat update because it's, it's, it's time, especially as we have, you know, more development of our goals and looking at the development of our schools that need attention like a Washington or Carver, mm -hmm. which you I think about a lot. Um, so thank you all. Any other questions right now? If Madam um, Chair, if I could, if that really was a timely question. Um, about two weeks ago, um, Dan Drake, myself, uh, the superintendent, and Lisa Brackett had had um, a conversation about at some point creating a special revenue 586 fund. I think is what we were we were calling it, um, and it's just for that purpose. Um, and what we would what we would do is um, you know with maybe some of the future revenue streams that will hopefully come from. Um, our efforts with our with, with our current e efforts with um, the excess properties, um, and even some of the past um, practices within the district of um, building rentals, those sorts of things. We put that revenue into this this 586 fund, um, and hopefully at some point that fund will be able to sustain and deal with um, the cost. Of ownership with with the excess properties, so we wouldn't be paying for grass cutting, um, graffiti removal, those sorts of things related to vacant properties out of the general fund. It would actually be money that we would we would potentially bring in through our building uh, rental programs, um, maybe some of the leases, and um, you know some of the work that we um, we're, we're we're hoping to kick off with um, AUDC. AUDC here fairly soon. That's great to hear. And as we appropriately support the creation of affordable housing in the state of Atlanta. So thank you for that. Um, anything else? Great. Thank you. Moving along. Let's see. What is so nutrition? Nutrition yes. is next. Yep. So we'll stay with operations. Wonderful. Great. Um, good afternoon, board members, Superintendent Battle. Um, my name is Eric Bankhead. I'm Senior Executive Director of Nutrition Services. And so I'm here to talk about the nutrition budget. And in those budgets, we have 690, 6691, 6692, and 6695. Purpose. The Atlanta Public Schools Nutrition Department provides all students healthy school meals that meet the daily nutritional needs and, and supports optimal academic performance for student success. Scope, currently all of our student meals are provided through USDA federally funded meal programs that provide well-balanced meals for all students. Allowable use of funds, USDA expenses for implementation of school meals throughout the district. So with, within the four budget codes we have with 6695, that's our supper meal program. 6990 is our school nutrition service program, which is our breakfast, lunch, and snack programs. We have 6991, which is one of our fresh fruit and vegetable programs, and 6992, which is the other fruit and vegetable program. Throughout those, the main increase will be in our um, school nutrition services program. We're looking at about a 28% increase in our budget. And as we know, in school year 25, the school district is going back to a self-operated program model for the first time in a roughly 20-something years. So I know we're excited about that. And so that's what you see there, as the, which represents the 28% increase. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, our allocation will increase. And that is based on some expected increases in meal participation for breakfast and lunch. And when we talk participation, we did some rough data of looking at the metro areas. And right now for breakfast, we're probably second in the metro area. And that's at a 39%, roughly a little over 39%. 
and we're about fifth in lunch, which is about 56%. So as you can see in both of those categories, we definitely have some work to do to get our meal participation up. So we're definitely looking forward to that. And then also, we also attributed some of that increase to just the self-op model. And when you're looking at self-op and you start thinking about food costs, because we've had a contractor, we know that we can't purchase the food for the same amounts that contractors have. Contractors get discounts because they probably have 400 and something other accounts. So they typically leverage that when you're looking at pricing. Um, also, when we look at our labor, you know, we know that we have a, a really good labor pro, um, package for our workers. Um, we talk about quality of life for the workers that live here in the city of Atlanta. So when you think about the difference in those, those are the two big buckets contributing to a lot of that, that um, increase. Some of the strategies that we've discussed is um, expansion of meal, menu concepts, adding a la carte um, offerings in all schools, opening up additional lines, and more stakeholder involvement in our menu development. And when we talk about the menu development, we've done some of that already starting in this year. We've had two different sessions of what we call Chew Crew, which is probably our platform to kind of solicit feedback from our students. And so we've had two sessions. We did one in the first half and we just finished our last one in March. And so a lot of that feedback that we're getting from those students is going into our menus that we're developing for FY25. And so, again, just uh, what, if anything, what are we changing? The biggest change for us is just going self-operated. Again, I broke down kind of those things. Before, you know, we paid a contractor. Now everything is on APS. When it's labor, it's food, all of that will be expenses of Atlanta Public Schools Nutrition Services. And so are we using the uh, funds in any different way? Um, technically, it's always been involved in providing food for students. We're just providing it in a different way, and we'll be expensing those funds in a different way. So we'll no longer be paying a contractor. They're, all of those expenses will be falling on us as a program. And that's the conclusion of that. And so any questions? Okay. I'm Rada? That's great. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. I just want to make sure that within here in terms of our goals and what we're aiming to meet that client or student sat satisfaction um, is, is high up on the list, meaning I don't want to buy cheap food just to make the number lower if it means that satisfaction is, going, is not going to be there. Um, so it, it looks like with the, the, the additions in terms of additional lines, the Chew Crew, and that, that we are aligned for customer satisfaction, but are there any goals in terms of what you want to hit regarding participation, like going from 39% to what and 50 something percent to what? What are we aiming for in terms of participation? So, so when what we would be success? Oh, okay. So when we built the model, we talked about anywhere from five to seven percent in the first year. And then we know that probably subsequent years, we're looking at anywhere from two to three percent because, you know, your biggest impact is in that first year when you're, especially when you're changing from a, a contractor where their first mindset is profit and ours is providing what students need. So that's kind of where we, are, we budget our, our, on our model. And did we talk at all? I believe Purpose Built Schools brought their nutrition in house last year. Um, did we consult with them at all in terms of challenges that they may have had, successes that they've had. I, I believe they've seen um, a definite increase in participation and was actually able to get both Carver schools on board. And the word of mouth was phenomenal in terms of increasing participation. But um, what type of consultations have, have we used to, to help with this process? Oh, good question. So we, we really haven't. When I look at um, when our, our management team is built on different backgrounds, like my 20 years, I was a contractor. We have some some self-operated. So a lot of the things that we use, we've been soliciting within a team and looking at the market studies on what's needed. Part of our true crew, true crew platform is not just food tasting. It's also asking the kids, um, if you don't eat in the cafeteria, what would make you eat in the cafeteria? What would you like to see in the cafeteria? And so we've used some of that data. We look at great, greater city schools data. So we've used all that data to start saying, as we're building a program, what are we trying to do? Uh, what do we need to do? What are, what, you know, what's the new models that kids are eating? So you'll see that developed in some of our menus. Um, you know, also a good part of that, a lot, you know, we're on our wellness meetings. We hear a lot from the communities, whether it's halal food or whether it's better options for special needs students. So all of that has been brought in. So that's how we've built to say, how do we meet 
students where they are because that's what a lot of parents were saying. We just don't have, you don't have the flexibility for us. And so we took that into account as we're building our menu and our program. Okay, my last question is around supper. Great. Um, how is that executed? Is that in all schools, certain schools, the supper program? Yeah, so it's in certain schools, and it's a certain part that they have to do from an academic standpoint and certain requirements with that. And so we do have a plan in place to grow supper. It hasn't been, like, high priority for us. Right now we're talking about how do we get breakfast, lunch, snack, right how do we fix those things and get that right first but we definitely know that there's some opportunity but the problem is just the flexibility so now we're having conversations with people to start thinking about it because it does take some partnership on both sides like if we go to the athletics and say hey we can feed your football team we have to make that flexibility work that the hours work for our staff to make sure we can do it right after school and it works with the practice schedule so we're working on some of those things to grow that program okay i thought it was done sorry ken one last question Food that is left over at the end of the day, is there a program or an idea in terms of how that food can either be shared with people who are experiencing food insecurity if possible, or what does that look like when the food is not all served in one day? Right. So right now, we, we haven't looked at that in a depth. You know, we hope through our trainings that we are, we're going to minimize that because, you know, we do try to manage that through waste and production. Um, but we haven't looked at as far as how do we go outside of that. Um, I've been hesitant against that sometimes just because of the food safety. Like, we don't know how someone else handles it. So I don't know if I want it coming back saying, oh, APS gave us food that caused people to get sick. Yeah. So we're just trying to deal with that and just see what's the best way to move that forward. Right. And, and if I could interject on that one as well, there are... Um, USDA policies and regulations that really kind of govern that yeah. and they're not really friendly to to giving that giving that food to third parties because of the liabilities associated with um, food handling you know potential lawsuits if you know if someone gets sick if it's not handled correctly if it's not distributed on that day it's distributed by the third party you know later on in the, in the um in the week or something um but we we do know there's certainly a goal of ours as well and and we um you know we're we've had conversations with um GDOE and uh USDA in the past um, to see how far we could actually go. It was during COVID, um, a lot of those regulations were, were relaxed, um, but now that we've, you know, or at least from, you know, from, from the USDA and GDOE standpoint, we're kind of beyond the COVID. We know that it's still out there. We're, so we're kind of back under the traditional type um, regulations. Um, so, we certainly understand the need, want to be respectful of the need, but we also want to make sure that we are compliant and, and we're protecting, you know, protecting the organization as well. Excellent. I just would encourage some creativity there. There may be a way that you don't use a third party that the kids just come through the line again at the end of the day. I don't know, but be creative or you could be handing over those vegetable scraps to yeah. the Magnus Jones compost. So. There could be ways to, to handle it in-house, and I just encourage us to be creative. Yeah, Absolutely. well, you, you, you mentioned kids coming back through the line a second time. You, you can't do that. So, again, and maybe we can take this offline, but... Um, you know the rules. Yes. Be creative yes. within, within yes. our restraints. Okay. okay. Mr. Bankhead, I'm so excited to have you on, on, on board. This is a big big event that's happening in 90 days. You're yes, standing up a $50 million business. Uh, you have to hire 500 staff to serve thousands and thousands of kids. I'm not trying to take, I'm not, I'm just, this is a flashing yellow light. It, it is, is how, how are you feeling? Are staff hired? Are we, are our processes in place? Are, are we ready to go day one? Because this is something that folks will notice if it doesn't, if it, if Absolutely. it, if it comes out of the gates uneven. Yes. Um, I'm actually feeling really good at where we, you know, where we stand right now. I think just um, yesterday we have already moved all of our cafeteria managers through for the next round for the next hiring step. So we've already identified those. Um, yesterday and today we have our team of area coordinators that have been interviewing all external candidates. And so we, when we look at our food service workers, we're probably about 150 that we're looking for. But we also have about 800 in the pipeline that we can interview from. So it's not a shortage 
of what we can get. It's just getting them processed, and that's what we've been doing. And so as far as the management team, I probably have four positions that I'm looking for. I got drivers, communications, HR, and one other one. So we're in a really, really good place of where we are. Menus are already developed. They're being tested. Um, so we're feeling really good where we are. We know that um, now we're at that, like that, final, <laughs> that final stretch. Um, and I know the pressure will get there, but the, but the team is up for the challenge, and we have some really, really experienced people that's been in food in K-12 food service for many, many years. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, 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 I'm excited about your optimism. Uh, I would say, you know, bad news or, or, or no, we can deal with bad news. Surprises are hard. Absolutely. And so if, if, if you start to run into difficulties, you've got a bunch of people around the tables uh, all around you, lean into that. Uh, because this is something that, uh, you know, we, 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 we like the momentum, uh, but this, all eyes are going to be on this in, in 90 days. Is the, I noticed that you, so it's a $10 million increase, uh, or maybe just a, a shade under, in fact, someone told yes, you not, not to exceed $10 million. And that's, <laughs> I, do, I do the same thing. Uh, is, the, is the ongoing operating costs going to be lower than it was in the, in the, um, in the contracted business because we don't have a profit motive anymore. It won't. So, so even without the profit motive that 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 our contractors have, we're still going to be a more yes. we're still going to be subsidizing this beyond. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And if I could speak to that, Eric, and, and, and I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> During our, um, our, our, our feasibility analysis um, and uh, back in March of um, 20, last year, 23, um, when we met with the administration and board to kind of walk through um, the setup or the decision for continuing with insourcing or outsourcing, um, we made it very clear, I have a copy of the presentation that was, that was delivered, that um, based on what we knew at the time and um, what we thought would take place between last year and this year, um, prior to us setting up the uh, nutrition department, that you know, they're based on our goals of increased meal participation, improved food quality, increased uh, daily meal choices, and um, the nutrition staff being employed by the district, we knew at that particular time because, as Mr. Bankhead had mentioned, school districts can't buy food at the same, you know, at, at, at the same price as food service management companies because of their volume discounts. So there would be a significant increase in food costs. And from a labor standpoint, Typically, the reasons why districts outsource food service is because of food costs and labor costs. And we knew that bringing it back in-house, we would now have to pay our employees market rate. And so it is a significant increase from what those folks are being paid under the food service management company arrangement um, to putting them on par equity with what our um, employees and metro, other metro area uh, districts, food service employees. Um, we shared at the time that I'm often asked, when do we think the nutrition program would be self-sustaining? And given the goals of this organization and given our realities, my answer to that today is not for the foreseeable future, respectfully. Um, at that time and in our presentation, we estimated a 10 to $15 million annual need from the general fund to the nutrition department. Also included in the presentation at the time, um, it was noted, those estimates were, were predicated, again, on what we knew at the time. We knew at the time that Georgia DOE, or the, 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 the Georgia State Health Program, um, had announced that there would be increases in state health costs. So in addition to the 10 to $15 million we kind of projected at that time, there was a caveat on that particular note indicating that it did not include what the upcharge would be with state health care benefits because we did, or health care, because we didn't know it at the time. 
think we just found it out here about a month ago, a couple weeks ago, um, Dr. Bracken. Um, so I say all of that to say, many of you may not know that the nutrition departments in school districts are not funded by the, de the Federal Department of Education. They're actually funded by the Federal Department, the USDA, United States Agri or, um, USDA, Department of Agriculture, right? Last year, food cross cost in, in the city of Atlanta um, for, for food away from home, um, CP, CPI was 9.2%. So there was an increase from the previous year to this year of 9.2% um, inflation. The federal government, even though there was an increase in food costs, the federal government decreased the reimbursement rate, per plate reimbursement rate, by 3%. So that's a 12% swing in the cost when, when we're looking at food. We won't know for next year what the reimbursement rate will be until July of this year. Okay, um, So we're competing with that. We're also competing um, um, with just natural inflation. Um, the other thing that, that we have to understand as an organization um, is that there's only opportunity to earn nutrition-related revenue 180 days out of the year. Federal government only allows you 180 days as a calendar. That's the only opportunity that you have to earn revenue. We pay our employees for 185 days a year, plus sick leave, plus vacation time. So, you know, in order to pay market rate and to bring folks internal. So I say all of that to say that there are a lot of factors involved in um, an in-source nutrition program cost control, um, you know, those sorts of things. So I'm not being flippant when I say um, not for the foreseeable future, right? And being realistic, when we say that we're fifth right now under the um, second, I think, for, for breakfast and fifth for lunch, it's by two or three percentage points. When you look across not just the metro, but um, the, you know the nation at large at school nutrition programs, folks aren't feeding at 100%. Those participation rates for lunch and um, and for breakfast, you know, are in the high 40s, the high 50s. Um, for you know, for lunch sometimes, you know, in the mid 60s, maybe early 70s. Um, one of, one of the things that we're trying to do for next year, it looks like we may have an opportunity to add six more schools to our um, CEP program where we're able to feed the entire school for free. Um, but there's some consequences to that. You gotta look at title and how it affects the, the title allocation. So we're, we're, going through, we're going through those efforts as well. Um, so in closing, um, my understanding, our understanding is, as board member Baldwin mentioned earlier, um, that we don't let food costs drive whether or not kids want to eat at school. We, we know that that's not a blank check, but we understand that um, our district's values um, lean more towards doing what's right for kids and doing what's right for our, our workers um, and we're going to try to control that as much as possible, but I, I just don't want anybody to walk away from this thinking that in two or three years that this program is going to be solved. Um, because it, it, my money would be on that it, that it won't be. And the other thing that we also have to take into account, um, annual cost of living adjustments for, for employees. Everything we do from a district standpoint, affects this program, right? So we have to keep that in mind when, when we're thinking about doing, doing things, um, you know, for the entire district. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Huskins. That definitely um, lays out the realities and you get what you pay for, and this is a priority for us. And thank you, Mr. Bankhead, for all the work you've done. Um, my only things I want to just feedback I've heard, wellness group, they've had great feedback. I know they're fantastic people from the community there. And then students giving their feedback, critically important. I know y'all are working on that. Um, and then, yeah, taking a look at the urban ag programs we have. I know this is down the road, but Washington has one. Of course, Carver does. and the farm at price they are putting looking to put that food in the cafeteria um and they are working with usda and i know the city has gotten some usda grants to look at um you know obviously expanding our urban farms knowing that that is not a reliable source of all our food like what opportunities in the future do we have because we have some great partners in the city in that space that are providing food for their communities and we know there's a connection to school um, it's right there. So, um, and yeah, and it involves students because students are part of those urban ag programs and they want to see them, no pun intended, grow. So, yeah. uh, uh, Madam couldn't Chair. help myself. And I'm not, I'm not saying we're going to put that food in right now, but just looking at, <laughs> I know where, I know where, I know where Ms. Hawkins is going, but it is like just talking about, you know, just even the connection. But I, I get that for the entire system that we are going to have to have something in place to make sure we have what we need for our students on a daily basis. But it is, it is cool to look at, like Aretta was bringing up, um, Purpose Built has actually. They are going to start moving some of their food, and ANCS does that now too. So, I mean, who knows what the future holds, but I understand the beginning. We are, we're not looking at that right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and we, we need to check with them because even those, those particular schools fall under us as the SFA. Um, and again, I go back to USDA regulations. You can't put that food in the cafeteria. So we need to kind of find out what's going on and make sure whatever ever they're doing is, in fact, allowable. And they do know the rules. They are following them just like... ANCS is fine them, but it, you know, absolutely, that'd be great for y'all to go check it out, and I think that's what I'm suggesting. <laughs> but I hear you, Mr. Hoskins, and I appreciate all the work everyone's done. I know we all do around bringing this in house, and the great news is it's been done in the past. I was a benefit of this in house food when I was in APS, and my kids eat the school lunch every single day. So. Thank you all so much. They do. They do. You want me to get them on the phone? They, they do every day. And actually, I will say from just anecdotally, um, Maynard Jackson has seen a, a huge increase with the number of kids eating lunch, like in the school cafeteria. So um, they eat it every day and looking forward to eating it from in-house production. So thank you all. If you build it, they will come. All righty, and then I have the very last slide in this section. So school activity funds, these are the bank accounts that individual schools maintain. These are the principal accounts, club accounts. Um, this is where we flow through forms of uh, funding related to student-generated accounts, receipts on, uh, around athletics, and different uh, co-curriculars and extracurriculars. We do ask the board to adopt this budget every year. That puts it within our fiscal responsibility. Now it has to follow all of our procurement rules and um, all, of, all of our maintenance around this and financial management. And so that's why we present this to you. Not a lot of details. This is what I do present to you quarterly when we do have the collections throughout the year and the spend down throughout the year. And we tend to uh, budget about 4.5 million for this each year. Any questions on this one? All right, and if not, I will move us forward to the general fund. So for the um, FY 2025 budget, we wanted to look both forwards and backwards to kind of ground us in where this fiscal year is. Um, when we look backwards at the, our expenditure story, you can see on this slide that we have had growth um, over the last 10 to 11 years. 
That growth was around 4% or so each year um, for quite a few years. And then in the last, uh, since FY 2022, that jumped to around 7% and then up to around 15 to 12% in the last two years. Salaries are a primary driver. Salaries um, is that blue section at the very bottom. You can see that there's been a 70% increase over the last 10 years, while benefits have increased by about 90%. Other purchase services is with, uh, where we budget for the charters. That's increased about 292% over that time. Um, and the overall general fund budget has increased by about 114% in the last 11 years. You did ask a question around the enrollment. That is as enrollment has declined over those same 14 years. So how we got here, I mentioned salaries. That is a primary driver just in the last two years alone. I think the annual Im uh, impact of salaries has about been about $60 million in each year. Benefits is a huge one. So uh, Mr. Hoskins referenced the classified benefit rates for this upcoming year. Um, for a little bit of story around that, we had budgeted $945 per member per month, which is about, um, a little over $11,000 per employee up until last year when the classified and over the last two years, the certified employee rates have increased by $815 or $9,780 per employee. That means certified um, rates at this point in time are $21,120 for just the state health. Sometimes that could even be more than like the salary. Um, and that is uh, a huge increase. It's about 86%. We do receive some state funding to offset that, though. So for the certified employees, you know, we do see the revenue coming in for that. What was surprising this year is we also saw a very large increase in classified employee rates. Those went up 67% as well. Um, so now we are paying $18,960 per employee that takes state health benefits then classified and receive no funding for that. And so that was also a 67% increase. So those continue to constrain our budget even as we continue to hire more and more people. So when we're thinking about position cost and the full position cost, we have to be even more mindful that beyond the salaries that maybe the employee feels day to day, there's a large cost around state health and also TRS to support those employees. At my previous budget commission meetings, we've talked about school size. Um, I did pull those slides back into the appendix of this presentation on page 60 is the in-depth analysis around APS's um, school size as compared to other metro districts. From that, we can see that we have about 12 to 48 more schools that we're supporting when we talk about deferred maintenance, when we talk about um, all of these things, transportation, that's the number of facilities that we're trying to move kids to and from. Um, and so there's a significant cost to our district that is different from other districts to support those buildings and the staff in those buildings. So we also have a very, very low uh, staff to student ratio as compared to metro districts. Uh, we actually employ about 2,600 to 3,700 more um, employees than other districts based on the staffing ratios compared to those districts. At an average salary of around 90,000 per employee, and that includes those state health benefits, um, we are paying about 234 to 336 million dollars for that decision, that value of keeping very low student to staff ratios. Some of the other primary cost drivers that kind of set our district apart when we're trying to compare with other districts is some of the central office structures and the rebound of our central office from previous rounds of reductions. So we've shown this chart before as well, the history of where we've made large reductions, large growth, large reductions in our central office that tends to follow the administration at the time, right? So as we have new superintendents, that can change in the focus of the, uh, the superintendent at that time. Also what's driven this, um, what we've seen is the large increase 
during and post pandemic. So we did have additional funding come in. So uh, instead of having to make some of those really hard trade-offs with a finite amount of resources, we all of a sudden had much, much more resources than in previous years. And so that did allow us, not only through ESSER funding, but the additional local funding that came in to pilot a lot of new initiatives and to drive additional um, additional cost. I teed this up at the board meeting last month, but we saw a lot of investments in the last three to four years really tied to those uh, guardrails from SOFT-G. So deep investments in equity, we saw the creation of an equity division, deep invest investments in innovation, we saw the creation of innovation departments, we saw a lot of uh, deep investments in piloting new programs and new initiatives, engagement, we saw a lot of additional spending and communication, staff engagement, student engagement, and also just around morale and culture, which was another guardrail, our compensation, stipends, um, a lot of the work that we were doing around morale was a very costly investment. So I think that the, the rebound of the central office was a very natural progression of trying to, of the administration trying to demonstrate a commitment to those equity guardrails, I mean to the guardrails in general. Now I mentioned that going forward in order for us to make sure that we are continuing to show the investment and our commitment to the guardrails, we probably need a fifth that also says in a way that is sustainable, in a way that is continuing to look at our systems, our structures, um, that we're looking at efficiency of that spend, and that we are, uh, that that guardrail is equally um, important as we are trying to get this work done. The quality of those investment, investments and not just the quantity. So that's what I mean by that central office rebound one. The charter system, um, and especially the school-based budget decision-making aspect of charter system, does create some inefficiencies just in the very nature of flexibility. Um, so there is a loss of economies of scale. We had our, um, our IT team pull for us just the number of software that different schools use, one-off softwares across the board. It's about $5 million. Um, there probably is an opportunity to save significant money if the school, if the district as a whole were purchasing two or three, saying that schools can use this, but we don't do that. We allow flexibility. Just in the nature and the portfolio of positions that schools can purchase is very different. So um, we don't have that standardized approach for anything in our schools. It requires additional supports as well. The student success funding formula um, is not the most efficient way of allocating if we have so many schools that through their enrollment do not generate a sufficient amount of funding to be able to run that school. A per pupil form formula works great when there's enough pupils to generate the funding. However, we have about 67% of our schools that are either receiving that small school supplement or we're having to build outside of SSF because the enrollment is so low that they would not generate sufficient funding. And then finally, just our programming, our initiatives and our supports. This could be also a part of that charter system, but even things like our signature programming is an expensive model. Um, a lot of our focus around SEL, wellness, I mean, I know other school districts don't have the same price tags that we do on some of the things around whole child supports. So these are all investments. I wanna be very, very clear. None of this slide is a value statement about whether this is good or bad. This has been our commitment. This is what we've invested in. We have annual budget parameters that guide this work. We have goals and guardrails that tell us to focus our work in these ways. But this is why we look different from other districts. When we're trying to compare our spend against other districts, when we're trying to see where our spend is being focused, these are some of the things that just, you know, I've been able to li lift to drive that. So then it becomes, how do we continue to sustain these in the out years? As we've lost significant number of students, um, we've, we are serving about 7,500 fewer students in our traditional schools over that same 14 year period, while we are continuing to invest in all of these uh, initiatives. So when we continue to just grow this out in the future years, we do have a 3% 
cap on revenue. We do know that that bill was passed, and so we should anticipate that local revenue will likely be capped in the out years. Um, at 3%, local revenue has been our primary funding source um, in the last, well, since I've been here. The state, we do assume some growth, but again, local fair share will offset that. Not as much if it's capped. Um, if local revenue is capped, our state should grow at a, at a healthier rate, may even become a higher percentage of our overall uh, budget spend going forward. We do want to come off of the usage of fund balance, so we are using it heavily this year to balance this budget. Over time, we want to make more systemic decisions with time to plan for how we can roll um, off our dependence of fund balance in the out years. Recall, we strategically built fund balance for this purpose. So we did uh, contribute to fund balance over the last two to three years um, to make sure that we were in really good standing. The budget that we're gonna present today still keeps us at or above 15% of fund balance to our expenditure projections. For the schools, we're assuming a, a healthy salary increase of 5%, but that's not what we've been doing the last few years. We've been above that. Uh, supplies up around 4% and contracts up around 6%, just as, um, just as estimates based on inflationary pressures and trend in history in the past. We also are assuming increases for the charters and partners based on the assumptions around revenue collections. Central office, again, assuming the very similar um, increases around salaries and our nutrition. Hopefully gradually less dependence, but as uh, Larry mentioned, probably never completely fully funded. Um, the district-wide, we see a large fall off in 2027 of um, when we do plan to pay off our pension liability to the city. And then for our grants and utilities, we just put a standard um, increase. So this isn't rocket science. There's nothing in, um, there's nothing too specific in these allocations, just high level assumptions. But even with these high level assumptions, what it demonstrates is even after all of the work we've done this year, um, the, the large decreases that we've made, especially in our central office, we will start next year in the exact same place with a $100 million gap. And within five years, even with additional revenue coming in, we should anticipate a budget gap of around $260 million. So we do have time. Uh, this is the main thing that I want to lift for this body, for our cabinet, for the board, for the community, is that as we are wrapping up the FY 2025 budget development process, we should be immediately planning for the FY 2026 budget process. So we do have a um, strategic planning process that will kick off in FY 2025. Um, and that will be the strategic plan for 26 through 30. We do have a SPLOST planning process that will kick off in 26 for the new SPLOST that will begin in 27. And we also have a charter system contract renewal which will begin in FY 2026. So those are three multi-year system-wide planning opportunities for this district to really engage the community for us to be thinking long-term um, and putting the systems and structures at the heart and the foundation of that planning so that we can start building our goals and guardrails and processes on top of that. Beyond those multi-year planning opportunities, we do have our annual processes, which is this budget process, and engaging that on an annual basis. And then also our facilities master planning process, which also is an annual process and kicks off in February of each year. So before I take a deep dive into what the details of the FY25, we'll pause, we'll take a deep breath, and I'll take any questions that you have. Now we're warming up. I mean, maybe we can start going into it more, because I know we have questions. But yeah, absolutely. We're Yep. <laughs> we, we can take over this whole time with our questions, but let's, let's just get into the, the details. Absolutely.
Oh, for the 25, so keep going. Okay, I'm so sorry. Sorry, let's, let's like go more ahead details into and this. Just or, okay. get into my, I apologize. All right, so I, I will clear. dive into FY 2025. So the consolidated general fund budget, we do say consolidated because as Lindsay mentioned in her presentation, Title I dollars are also a part of this budget. Um, our, we are assuming local revenue will go up by about 9%. That is an optimistic increase, but it is in alignment with the trends that we've seen in the last few years. So it is not out of, um, out of reality. It is more optimistic than we would tend to be at this point in time. Um, we are the we do we got state revenue yesterday. So actually yesterday afternoon we received the state QBE. It is higher than we've projected here, and we've already allocated that <laughs> for three initiatives that I'll talk to when I get down there. So we did receive additional state revenue, and the waiting list is long. So those already been kind of uh, reallocated back up. Other um, is just a small decrease. That's where we have things like tuition e-rate. Uh, the transfer is the Title I transfer in, and again, at this point in time, we're expecting that to remain relatively flat. And fund balance, we are um, estimating a usage of fund balance that keeps the total fund balance at 15% of expenditures or greater. For the expenditures, tra traditional schools, we've built in a 3% salary increase already into the SSF and traditional school allocations. We did build in the benefit rate increases. We added a counselor equivalent salary into each of our schools for them to use flexibly as they need to. And also as part of our reductions, we've talked to principals about this yesterday, we are reducing their hold back or their reserve by 50%. That was a cut um, recommendation in order to close our gap. The charters and the partner schools, we have placeholders in there for um, based on the initial um, local revenue and fund balance usage. Part of that new state money will be set aside and district wide because we do anticipate an increase in these allocations as our state and local revenue goes up. Central office, we made significant reductions. I'll talk more when we get to the cut slide on this um, about the rounds of reductions that we've gone through. But across the board, we did 50% travel uh, reduction to travel, 3% and non-personnel. We reduced positions, both filled and vacant. Um, additional non-personnel co co costs. Um, and also, um, a lot of that was offset by the classified and state health uh, health rate increases. So we did see all of the positions that are still here had that increase of, of uh, multiple thousands of dollars. Um, nutrition, we did earmark a, a, a general fund transfer to the new nutrition fund of about 12 million. Um, and we will be working with the nutrition office to see how we um, transfer that. I think at this point we were talking about a drawdown um, where on a quarterly basis we see what's been spent and we will do a transfer to the nutrition fund as needed. But the funds are earmarked in the general fund at this point in time. The ERP is the uh, is well needed. Unfortunately, that was one of the um, areas that we look to reduce to try to offset that until the SPLOS. That would be one of the first things that we look to add back. Um, if new funding becomes available or if we're able to use additional fund balance, we are well on our way in the ERP um, RFP process. And so we want to be able to salvage as much of that as possible. And this, uh, if you've been to any of our audit committee meetings, you know that the ERP presents quite a risk to the district. Um, and so that is one thing we really want to try to get back on the table. So we're going to continue to be uh, creative and innovative and in in how we try to find funding for that. But at this point in time, this budget does not include it. Readers are leaders. Um, we earmarked funds for the schools. There is one literacy coach in every elementary school in this budget. We have some central office supports um, for those positions and some supply funding set aside. This budget does not include the 3.5 million set aside for stipends. Um, the we were looking we was that was on the wish list for Lindsay to use ESSER funds to spend down. However, we want to use the state funding for that. So that's the second add back that uh, with the state funding, we will add the 3.5 back for the readers or leaders stipends. 
Our safety and security investments are continuing to, continuing to increase. This 2.1 here is general fund only. We are still waiting to get additional information around the $45,000 per school or per campus um, state grant for safety. So that is in the state grants line item, but is also an additional investment for safety for this year. Compensation, um, our Chief Human Resource Officer, Nicole Lawson, presented the compensation um, estimates and recommendations at the March Budget Commission meeting. This placeholder, while the full um, allocation would be about 58 million, again, some of that's already been built into the school budgets. Some of that we are reducing because we are um, assuming some last salary assumptions in this budget, and some of that was earmarked for special revenue. So overall, we're seeing a three, 35 million or so in our district wide to push out for compensation once the budget's been approved. Utility rates are up just across the board, rates and usage. Um, so we are capturing that cost. You'll see an increase coming to the May board for the current year for utility uh, cost as well. Pension, we do a 3% annual increase to the uh, contribution to the pension fund. And again, that will be fully paid off in 2027 as long as we stay on track. So um, just you know, holding the line on that one. State grants, we saw a large decrease as our uh, an alternative fuel bus grant sunsets. And then also our district wide, we budgeted there for the two one-time $1,000 stipends that we paid out in FY 2024. And so those will roll off. Um, they will not be a part of the initial FY 25 allocation. So showing our work, um, when we presented to you, I think back in um, February or March, we presented a large budget gap. Um, round one of finding ways to close that gap is we did come up on our conservative revenue assumptions. We did go to a more optimistic revenue assumption and we earmarked the fund balance usage up to 15%. So trying to do all that we can on the uh, revenue side of that gap to bring more money in or to allow us to be more, um, be more strategic in how we're capturing the revenue side. Round two uh, was that central office, we restored all requested increases. So where central office budgets have requested increased increases, we went almost across the board and just reset to the previous year and then did an additional 50% um, cut to their travel, and we asked for 5% non-personnel reductions. Most of our district offices were able to achieve that uh, reduction to non-personnel. And we also um, did a scrub of salary and benefits, just making sure that we weren't allocating benefits to positions that don't take benefits, um, and just getting as lean as we can. There's no cushion in the, these benefit budgets. Round three um, is where we did go to the school reserves. So the school reserves, when we build their budgets in January, uh, we set aside about 2% of their SSF allocation. So we are recommending a 50% reduction of that, which would be about a 1% decrease to their SSF allocations. Round four. Uh, was actually an ad back. So we found out just last week about the state health increases, um, and that added about five million back to the gap that we, right, I think the day before we were having our gap closure conversations, I had to call everybody and say five million more. So um, every time we, we think we're there, we just go back a little bit further. Round five was those deeper, deeper central office reductions. So these were the really hard talks. Um, these occurred last Thursday. We will not have a lot of information on those today as we are still having conversations with impacted employees or departments. And so those will continue to occur, I think, through the remainder of this week. We do hope to have everything wrapped up by close of business on Friday. And when we do bring the tentative budget to you in May. We will have the department sheets. We'll have all the details um, that our, our typical budget book that supports all that, but we didn't want to get ahead of any conversations uh, with this work. 
And then round six were some of the deferral of those new initiatives, uh, which was the ERP and those literacy stipends. With the state, I feel comfortable going ahead and adding back the literacy stipends. I know Matt and his team are doing all that they can to try to get that ERP request as low as possible so that we can uh, see if there's anything that we can move around or do differently to try to get that in this budget. That will be something we'll continue to try to do right up to final adoption. Um, I think with that, does it make sense for us to pause for a second or to keep going through the parameters? I think it does. Okay. Um, I'm going to let my colleagues um, start with any questions. Jessica, do you have any right now? I do, actually. Um, let me see if I can get back to where, where the first question was. Um, so on slide 43, I believe it was, you... Um, it was the discussion around the student success funding, and you said mentioned that um, some schools are building outside of SSF. Can mm -hmm. you provide a little more details about that? And then I guess probably a, a partnering that with on slide forty eight, the the impact of dropping the school reserves by fifty percent, just so we have more clarity around sure. that, that impact for schools. Sure, absolutely. So um, I do have my budget team here, so if I miss any, feel free to shout at me. But that's uh, BEST, CSK, Hank Aaron, Phoenix, ACCA, and AVA. So some of our non-traditional schools and programming um, is built uh, outside of SSF. And it's because if they were in SSF, they would, again, when we talk about the pie, the pie, they would redistribute so much funding from our traditional schools that you would see huge reductions, especially at some of our high schools, as you redistribute to them. So they were pulled out, set aside, and their budgets are built in a more traditional model, looking at number of students generates X number of staff. Um, so that was what that is referring to. The 1% reduction um, with the schools, we did meet with schools yesterday at the principal's meeting and let them know about this. One thing that we're recommending that they look at is the same thing that we are looking at in the central office, which is travel, which is the redundancy of software and contracts, um, which is any of those like we have professional development contracts, we have different things like that that we're asking schools to just go back and reconsider. Um, I gave everyone a challenge yesterday. We've had funding in the last few years that have allowed us to solve problems by adding additional money to the pot, right? So if we had a problem, if we weren't getting the services we needed, we were able to just go out and buy it, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of having the hard conversations or holding accountable why we weren't getting those services to begin with. And so part of the challenge is, you know, I expect friction around this as we reduce the as we reduce the resources from both sides, there will be a necessary dialogue around how do we then provide those services, who's responsible for the services, how do we hold each other accountable to the to the services and the outcomes around those services. So, you know, friction can be a good thing um, sometimes. And so that friction on both sides, I think, will hopefully help around some quality of what the schools are experiences. I know Tommy and I have talked a good bit around that accountability piece and, you know, have needing to have necessary conversations. So. And, and I, I appreciate that context. I think um, if, as an at-large member, what I see across the district, there are some schools and some school communities that are more agile in their ability to sell, to fundraise to cover mm -hmm. a lot of those external expenses and then other schools that are not. And so at the district level, are we providing any resources to help those, those schools, those clusters and schools that aren't as agile to yeah. fundraise for their problems to make sure that if there are still gaps after we cut, you know, the, the PDs or whatever else you are, you listed out as op opportunities for them to, to lean into their budget. Uh, what resources are we providing at the district level to give, to make sure they have those skill sets to raise above and beyond to make sure all of those needs are met? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that there is a conversation there and making sure that we are um, helping schools to fill gaps in a way that is equitable, so leaning into those schools that may have a harder time filling the gaps. We've already already been approached by principals who said, I'm going to have a really hard time with this, and we will handhold through those. One of the things we also see, and it's not necessarily, 
I mean, I guess it's a, a testament of the good job that our SSF funding is doing is that we are seeing a lot of carryover or balances remaining in schools that are receiving a high amount of both title and poverty dollars through our SSF weights. And so what we did also mention to schools yesterday is we will allow a certain percentage of non-personnel carryover into next year to help offset some of these costs. So that allows schools to kind of plan with their own fund balance in the current year. It also helps us in that we don't see the large spin down of just like this fear around use it or lose it mentality where we see schools bulking up on supplies and things like that. We're asking them to hold off where they can, continue to spend if you have needs or strategic plans around that spend. But if you don't, hold off on spending it. Um, and then we will allow that to roll into fund balance and then recommit it to the schools next year during leveling to, so that they can plan themselves for how to close these gaps. Um, and we do see that the schools that are most likely unable to raise those funds have the most available this year to be able to roll those dollars over. Mm -hmm. And so we'll provide schools, if we haven't already today, we'll be providing them what their non-personnel is as of today so that they can start planning for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, and I just want to add on to Lisa um, to, to make sure we all understand, although we are making some cuts, as Lisa said, our schools have the funding. A lot of times we just assume because we're cutting, we don't have the money, we don't have what we need. I would beg to, beg to differ that all of our schools in Atlanta public schools have what they need, and it's how we're using the funds that we get. So that is where the handheld holding is gonna to have to come from associate superintendents, from chief of schools, from budget, from everyone, because um, I always say, let's walk the building. Like when you always, when we talk with our board members, because principals are going to always say we need more. But we have lots of funds in Atlanta public schools. In our schools, our student ratio, the support. I would love when Lisa talked about or someone talked about when you said we're cutting. Um, it was Amandia, uh, Miss Ford from Special Ed talked about all the, someone asked about the behavior specialists or someone. I said, we have so many people supporting our students. It's how we're using them. If we're suspending kids and we have all the support, oh, well, that is not a special ed issue. That's a leadership issue. That's a, that's a culture issue. So we have to dive a little deeper instead of talking about the funds, but what are we doing with it? So we're here to support the schools, but we have to hold everyone accountable. It's the accountability that's missing. Thank you, Dr. Bracken. Uh, big, big. You know, this is the this is the Super Bowl, right? Uh, no, no. So, uh, one easy question, one hard question. Easy question is if you can go to slide. I'm trying to figure. I'm trying to back. I'm trying to catch up with your math on the central office reductions. Okay. If you go to you, you list. Uh, keep going. It's slides. Sorry, I should have wrote the slide down. Um, where you list off the budget, your gap closing. Uh, well, actually, so let's stay here for a second. So here, you, you went from 235 to 225. Mm -hmm. So a, a reduction of 11 million, or just under 12 million dollars. Go to your gap closure. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's 33 million in round two and 23 million in round five. Yep. How, how do you get to 11 million? So on this slide, the 23 million and the 33.4 million will tie to the budget parameter slide around identifying redundancies and efficiencies in the administrative overhead. So that 57 million here is also tied to the reductions here. How, how come we don't see it then here? What you're seeing here is the net impact of a lot of different things. So this so is also the state health increase offsetting that $56 million is some increases. And so like when we talk about increases in some of the air, other areas and around our parameters, not every department was reduced by X amount, right? We had growth. We had departments that grew in support of some of our budget parameters and some of our initiatives. And so what we are seeing is if I just, when we built the budgets and we had a cuts column, 
where we went back through and made reductions, that cuts columnists $56 million. Some of that is often an ask that was increased, so some of that is restoring. Um, when we go back to this slide, $33.4 million, some of that wasn't a cut to 2024, it was a restoration right, I guess that's, so we're, I feel like we're, we're not, I mean, that's why it's a little confusing, because here you make it seem like we're, we're cutting all this money out of the central office, but in reality, we're not. We're cutting less than, you know, just a few, we're cutting, what was that, uh, 5%? So, okay, I mean, that's good, but not as, see, when you look at that slide in and of itself, you get the sense that cuts are, 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 are substantial. I know these cuts are not easy, but we are obviously serving less kids. We're a smaller district than we were. Yeah. And, we're, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not living out the, we're not seeing these in our central office reductions. Yeah, and I think that's why we wanted to show it two separate ways, because this does hide a lot of the hard work. Um, this looks like only a 5% reduction when we know just that state health benefit alone is going up 67% on every single salary um, or every single position in the district, which is increasing this cost and offsetting a lot of that hard work. And we don't want to hide the hard work um, in this line item and the, what that will mean in service for schools. So we don't want somebody to look at the central office line and say, only a 5% reduction, I shouldn't feel any impact in the schools. They will. The schools will experience a reduction in service from some of our departments who experienced really large reductions. And we want to make sure that we are being transparent about that as well and setting expectations that as we streamline our central office, it will be, um, it will impact some of the, some of the increases that maybe schools were expecting to see in services from central office will be offset. Well, the other thing I just wanted to call out is this is from our March slide when we talk about um, the number of staff that we have and the number of schools that we have, um, it does make it very difficult to streamline a central office that is still supporting the same number of schools and positions in the field. So let's, let's, let's pick up on that, because that's, okay. really, that's really the larger question that you've been kind of laying the breadcrumbs for for the last few, few meetings since, mm -hmm. since, since I sat around this table. I guess it's really more of a question I for, thought there were loaves of bread. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> big, big, big scoops of carbs. This is for maybe for you, Dr. Battle. So we have this freight train coming towards us. Highest compensation in the region, smallest school rate, so smallest number of, or uh, the most small schools in the region, the high, the lowest student teacher ratio in the region, scores that would not necessarily match that experience. Uh, Dr. Bracken's telling us that the trains, you know, we, we, the, the oncoming train's coming, uh, we have to act now, and we are, we, now is the time in the cycle because this is when we start planning for 26. What What is, can you, can you, you know, and because and, and, when, when we first started talking, Dr. Bracken said she was going to bring us choice points about that we were going to choose. It doesn't seem like that's going to happen. It seems like this is the choice. So what, what, when we're here next year, we're here over the next six months, what, what work is going to happen to get us to a place where we can get ahead of this? The first thing we're going to have to work on our strategic planning as well as our facilities master planning. What are we going to do? Are we going to stay with small schools? Are we going to talk about closing these small schools? And then when we bring it, if we talk about closing small schools, are we going to have our board say we're going to close them and then we get to the meeting and we don't close them? So we're going to have to have a real conversation about um, as this train is moving, we know what we can do for this year and going into next year, but the year after, we're all going to have to be on the same page and make the same commitment because we don't want to spend time saying that we're going to do this and this is going to be our master planning, and then when we get to the meeting, it's like, no, we're not. We're going to, let's back up one thing. So I'm ready to go. We're ready to go. That, that's so the answer I, will, I was hoping for. I will say that Travis and I have been done, doing already a lot of brainstorming around strategy and engagement and planning for these types of conversations and the way that he's helped me to understand it is really, it's a question of value. And again, if we remove the right and wrong of the whole conversation, it's just a system of decisions over decades, right? That has got us to where we are. Micro decisions that build up and accumulate over time. And this is just a system of more decisions that need to be made. Um, and when we talk about the values, there may just be a conversation of realigning or re reassessing what our values are. It can be perfectly feasible that small neighborhood schools as the cornerstones of a neighborhood 
is a value that we think is the most important for moving students forward. We can say that a high student to staff ratio is the thing that's going to help our kids. That's, that's a perfectly fine value. But what we haven't been doing is trading off that and saying, so we won't have Cadillac models in those schools. We might not have the highest compensated teachers, and we might not have all the programs, right, that we want to have. That's fine. But what we haven't had to do is, or what we haven't done in a long time, is have those value trade-off conversations. And I think even as we just tee this up, because I don't want us to start the process with a solution in mind, we might all have our own opinions about how to solve this. Lisa's just one person, and all Lisa's trying to do is hold up the information and say, guys, we all have to look at this. Um, but I don't think any one person has the solution to this. So what I do hope to do over the next five year or next next year, next and especially over these summer months and leveraging the time in between a budget season, because once you're in budget, it is just about building this year. You don't have choices because we didn't have choices. Like we are just trying to balance um, this budget. We started with 100 million. Next year we'll have 100 million. I don't want to have our hand tied, our hands tied in March next year with a hundred million dollar gap and saying this is all we can do right let's start now to think about what that looks like did you want to add anything just to run your thoughts up there oh okay. i just want to add one thing i think when we talk about the, the small schools we also need to talk about schools with two campuses because it, it plays in both ends we got to look at everything we have these schools with two campuses, or whether a ninth grade campus or a primary campus, yeah. we have to look at those too. We have to make the hotline. Are we going to make two schools out of that? Because that impacts our transportation flow. It impacts so much more in our schools. So I think when we have that conversation, we need to have the totality conversation, not just small schools, but those kids, um, schools with multiple campuses. And I will say that um, of the schools with dual campuses, only one is not a small school once those students are spread both, across both campuses. So they are small schools um, if you take into account, account both comp, uh, campuses, and they're included in that 67%. Good afternoon. If I could just, uh, Lisa said everything perfectly, uh, but I do want to <laughs> take the opportunity, if it's all right, to then push a little more on what uh, we hope to also get from the board in this, and that's part of this timeline. The reason we put those timelines on the bottom, we have made commitments to the community that we would not rezone students without a full year's notice for transitioning, transition planning and support. So even if decisions were made after, as soon as after May, June of this year, it would not take effect based on our current practice until 26, 27, um, which would not impact next fiscal year's $100 million gap. And so that's a decision point that the board will also have to reflect on if we're going to continue with that practice when making some of these decisions. And then also uh, the role of the superintendent search in this. We have, um, we have created strategic plans with uh, waited for a new superintendent to create a strategic plan, and then we've created a strategic plan in preparation for hiring a superintendent. There's pros and cons to both. We don't have time on our side on some of these decisions, and so we also need to have a conversation from the board on the expectation of strategic planning on what we are okay starting before the hiring of a superintendent and what we must wait till the hiring of a superintendent. Thank you. The other thing I'd like to add to this equation is the definition of we, and that it's not just us sitting around here having these conversations, but that the community has been properly informed and engaged and feel as if that this process is happening with them and not to them. And that's going to be incredibly important, especially if we're talking about consolidations or closings. We need to have a conversation about the benefits as well as the challenges and obstacles um, with the thought that if everyone is a part of, of, of the solution, then it'll be easier for people to be on board and to support the decision. So I, I'm just in, I'm pushing, pushing, pushing that the we is not just the people in this room, um, but is inclusive yeah. of, of the vision and values of our community and stakeholders. 100% and going back to like over time these decisions have been made and now that we have our goals and our guardrails how are we focusing in on our priorities 
Like we, we know what our current student outcomes are and we, need, we must improve them. And what is that going to take? And the work you're doing right now, working with schools to say, okay, what have you been doing that you may not have next year, but what is having the most impact? And that support from CLL. So we get, you know, in May, the specific positions knowing that we're not taking away the support that's really had the most impact. I mean, that's one thing I've been thinking about because there's some things that are just more convenient to cut and there are some things that could be actually having the most impact. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, you know, we've done that deep dive analysis <laughs> to see, you know, what is having the most impact on supporting our schools um, and making sure we're not cutting those, um, but making the necessary cuts that will allow us to have more money to benefit students on the ground. Um, and as we move forward, yes, we have to be honest about the realities of our system right now and think at it from the perspective like we keep talking about, like the programming, the student experience, and what the opportunities are. But we know that will take some long-term planning, but there's some things we can start to talk about now with the community. Um, and But again, why we would need to do those, not just because we want to be the most lean system, because we want to improve student outcomes. And mm -hmm. we haven't seen those outcomes dramatically increase for students who've been struggling the most historically. I mean, that is the fact. So I'm so glad we are at this point in this district where you know we know we have a board that's very focused on it. We obviously have an interim superintendent who is, and a staff who is, and we have money. Um, but the fact that we're still coming back to this place means we've got to do something differently. Um, and I know these decisions and conversations are extremely hard, so I appreciate everyone having them. Um, but yeah, we have got to, as a board, with facilities master planning, really retreat in terms of what are our priorities and how are we gonna adjust our resources to meet those needs, um, which is all really opportunity. So my questions were, you know, again, around the positions, I had asked that question, but no, we'll get more information in May. You know, I too, like Ken, looked at the 5% decrease and doesn't seem as significant. We're looking at 50% cut in travel, but understanding the state requirement and the what we have to pay towards um, state health. So I, I hear you. Um, making sure that the Readers Are Leaders program is sustainable long-term. I know we're using the fund balance right now, but that's a huge initiative that's gonna take time and support. We know we're gonna have additional costs and needs. You know. We are hearing from folks that they're excited about it happening, but they're like, I've seen us roll this out in APS and then we don't have the continual support. Um, this is not a one to two to three year initiative. This is going to be decade. I mean, who kn it's going to continue. So I wanted to make sure that we're really thinking about those costs as we move forward. Um, and then I know Ken asked some about it, but the economies of scale with the charter system, like knowing that Fulton County's had a charter system for a long time, like what can we adjust and change maybe that we can help have some economies of scale? Um, I'm sure that's something y'all are thinking about, but that's something that stuck out to me. Um, and then, um, yeah, like Jessica said, the school reserves at 1% decrease. I, I look at the budget for every single school and I see how much we have per pupil and I'm thankful we have those resources, but knowing that's still a, a shift and a change. So, However, we can be provided information that's at a higher level. I know it doesn't need to get in the weeds, but how we're hand-holding, like you said, Dr. Battle, for folks who do have to adjust and shift, um, I think would be helpful. So I know those weren't particular questions, but um, yeah, that economy to scale, I've been thinking about that a lot too. Any feedback you wanna share right now on that one? I'll speak to, I took note of three things that I think you're gonna speak to now. Um, I, I, so I was able to sit in on all of the conversations around the budget reductions. Um, and I can say that the lens around that conversation was absolutely squarely on what is most, uh, what is what has been working for students, right? So it was proximity to students and proximity to the core of the work um, that really led and drove those conversations. I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, but that's really how we started looking at um, where those reductions might be uh, made. The second thing um, that I'll lift is that economies of scale, the trade-off is flexibility, right? So what we saw, at, I was at Fulton when we became a charter district, 
and we had much more flexibility than I think Fulton has today. I think Ken was there too when Fulton became a charter district and we were going far towards flexibility. Um, even in our funding model, I was pushing for a student success funding formula at that time um, and just thinking about what sort of flexibility they would have. And I think that they have come off of flexibility some in the out years to really prioritize efficiency around some of those decisions. And so I think part of what we will need to do is go back to the drawing board and think about where flexibility is actually giving us a return. Um, and where it's not having the hard conversations around sacrificing that flexibility for more efficiency. And by efficiency, I don't just mean less spend. It could be the same amount of spend, but that we're actually getting something for that spend. Um, but that will be a shift in the way that we've operated uh, over the last you know 10 years that I've been here. And so I think when we talk about efficiency of scale, it's those mindful conversations around that means flexibility. And those are the kind of shifts I know I'm personally looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard earned autonomy put out. Um, autonomy is important in that, you know, our principals know the needs of their students in their communities 100%. But also, you know, making sure we're having that highest impact. And that's the job of the district mm -hmm. to be looking at that and supporting it. So I'm very glad we're, we're doing that work and certainly have my support in making shifts around that area. Um, anybody else right now? Um, no, I will address your reserve concern. Yes, please, that please. Slide. Um, so just moving us forward, I'm going to click through these, but these are the budget parameters that we created at the beginning of our budget commission process together. And so what we show is the item ver uh, against our goals and guardrails, some of the investments. This is new investment, not total investment. So um, it's, it's not... We're not just doing 58 million for compensation, we're doing 58 million more than we've done in the past for compensation. And some comments around that. Um, and then we can continue to just see on this slide some of the investments in some of our other areas. Um, this is the typical budget by function slide that we always put together. This is what we will advertise um, as part of our overall budget. Function is what we would all uh, districts in the state are required to use for reporting and so it's a good way for us to compare to other districts um, and you can see on this slide uh, maybe a little more clearly the percentage decrease in the general administration um, as an overall spend uh, overall amount of allocation towards the budget as we continue to increase our spending in pupil services uh, staff services and instruction. So as a overall allocation, we're continuing to drive more to those uh, functions that are closest to the student. Can I ask one quick question? Sure. Going back to that slide. Number 10, increase to PAC transfer. We know PAC is important and the work they're doing, but we're increasing the amount. Yes. So the PAC transfer is to supplement the state's salary schedule to our salary schedule. So every time we give a raise, we have to increase the amount that we're supplementing to the state. Anytime we give a raise that's higher than what the state is giving, then our supplement to keep them on the APS salary schedule increases. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Budget by object. Um, so this is where we're seeing large increases in salaries and um, uh, and other compensation as an overall proportion to our budget. Again, our charter allocations are continuing to increase as a higher percentage of our overall budget. Um, this is the impact of fund balance slide. And so um, for the FY 2025 proposed budget that we have br brought to you today, um, we are building right up to that 15%, um, which is not quite the 16% or two months the GFOA's recommendation, but it well exceeds the board parameters of less than no, uh, no less than 7.5% and the state's cap of 15%. So we are right up against that. If we were able to go just a hair further into fund balance, we could bring back the ERP. Um, and already with the state increase, we have in, uh, added back the literacy stipends. Um, I'm not sure what that right column is. I think that's just a extra column. Fund balance usage. So here we do try to book um, certain 
um, expenditures against the fund balance so that we can easily identify what those may be if we needed to do reductions. We identify this based on the board's kind of guiding principles and resource parameters. So uh, when we are developing the budget parameters, we use these guiding principles to help us to determine what our budget parameters should be for the upcoming year. Um, and we do have one around the fund balance that says we will maintain a fund balance of 15% of total general fund expenditures. Um, but it also says that we will strategically utilize the fund balance to ensure operational integrity of district programs, support expenditure parameters, and temporarily offset potential decreases in revenue. So we do want to maintain a fund balance, but the board also commits to using the fund balance in ways that um, continues to support some of our initiatives. So we did book some of the expenditures for this upcoming year to fund balance based on that. So some of our contingencies are just things that we identify as one time in nature we can use fund balance for. Some of our um, pilot initiatives or other budget parameter initiatives we are using fund balance for. So that's why you see nutrition and readers or leaders are here. Not necessarily that those are one time, but it's the first year of those and we need time to incorporate those into the general fund um, as we identify some of those sun items that we could sunset or those value propositions of what we're going to not do in order to continue doing these new initiatives. Um, our pension, we do by, by state, um, we're required to pay about 19 to 20 million on an annual basis into our pension. The board in 2014 um, adopted a policy that says we will do the 3% annual scaling to the pension. That is the right decision. I'm not recommending that we don't do that, but we do know that that contribution to the pension plan is for a short term. That is a finite investment and it will sunset at some point. So we can book some of the pension costs to the fund balance. Um, other things that we look at are those things that would be easily, not necessarily one time in nature, but they're places we would look if we needed to mid-year or at uh, some point in the year shift if um, for whatever reason. And so overtime stipends, part-time type work, we can book against that as well. And next steps. So um, following this meeting, we have a very tight timeline for when we have to get advertisements to the AJC to advertise the tentative adoption. At tentative adoption, which is at the May 6th board meeting, we will also have our first public hearing as is required. Um, that will, and then we will have the tentative adoption. Our regional meetings, we're still playing with this. Um, regional meetings, is, we used to always have regional meetings. We would go to four or five different school sites. Um, some of you have came to those regional meetings and you saw that you were maybe one of three people there. When we move to virtual, we're having hundreds of people attend our, our regional meetings. So what I do want to play with the idea of is continuing to have our main meetings virtually. We'll continue to have those um, available and then I'm happy to attend any of your meetings in the month of May to just talk budget. And so it's continuing to leverage the opportunities where people are already coming out instead of making people come out for a second conversation. Um, I'm happy to lean in wherever I can to get as many people aware of what is in our budget and to get feedback on it as much as possible as well. But instead of regional meetings, we'll probably have virtual meetings over the course of May. Um, budget commission and changes between tentative and final. Uh, we'll discuss that on May 16th. So anything else that is moving in between um, what you are adopting or will be seeing for adoption in May, we'll discuss on May 16th. And then we will repeat the advertising requirements, have the second public hearing, and then final adoption on June 3rd. So very tight timeline, but we are on track to complete it all. Um, and I'll take any final questions that you may have. So, Dr. Bracken, I just I just want to thank you and your team. I was just I was coming up with what, what the what the big takeaways are from this budget. You know, the highest comp we're going to be the highest uh, compensated district in the region. We're going to lower central office costs by five percent. We can debate maybe maybe you think it's more, but it looks like it's five percent. Uh, we're going to invest in literacy, and there's no increase in millage. And so that's all good news. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do. So thank you to the team. I know this is not easy, and I appreciate you keeping that fifteen percent uh, um, floor. Uh, these are these are the right direction, but I think your larger point that this is 
uh, it's going to take more to move this battleship than just um, just a, a, a couple of steers. We're really going to have to lean in, and I, I, I think you've, you're hearing from the board that we're we're looking for that opportunity. I appreciate, thank you, everything, but also the breakdown behind that net five percent decrease because ultimately there was some significant decreases that happened. And I think it's important that that be communicated, that when you see a net difference of 5%, but like you said, there were significant cuts that will also impact the services to those schools. So I think it's important that that be clear, that again, it was a net decrease, but the, but the decreases in services are grander or more grand yeah. than, than, <laughs> than you see on that chart. Yeah, we'll I appreciate. We'll unpack that in detail um, when we bring the tentative adoption. And I also meeting. just wanted to say that I too raised my eyebrow just a wee bit when I saw the hold back to the schools, knowing that we were intending to give them more. A little bit comforting, knowing that schools mm -hmm. ended up with surplus a lot of times, mm -hmm. and so really, it's up to mm -hmm. us to lean in to help them make more impactful decisions mm -hmm. on how to spend that money mm -hmm. and not just with school leadership but i hope that those conversations are also happening with the go team who who is a, you know as a part of this process mm -hmm. and so that they're fully under, understanding that as well so thank you well i'll just echo my colleagues um, feedback and compliments. You guys have done an incredible job. You know, it's a big shift. It's a lot of work. Um, and know we're going to be there to support our schools and our staff and everyone, but also seeing the shift is a reminder we have more work to, be, to do. Um, but it's all focused on students. And like Aretta says, communicating that out is the job of the board and the job of the district. So I um, also want to ask you in closing, during the summer, you know, if there's anything we can do to support just thinking ahead, please let us know. Um, so follow back up with us on that. Um, anything else anybody wants to add? Go team. Before we close out? <laughs> All right. Hey, we, we, end, we, we ended early. 2.48. Wow. Thank y'all. Nothing like ending a three-hour <laughs> meeting, meeting early. Hey. Five, 12 minutes. I that. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And then with that, um, do you have a motion to adjourn? So uh, no, we oh, didn't, we didn't oh, do public, public comment. comment. Oh, yeah, my we goodness. We got to talk to the public oh. manager. <laughs> three-hour meeting. That's what happens. <laughs> and I'm glad we had it this time. Um, public comment, Mr. Gaither. Yes, I see. Yeah, so we actually had call. two individuals who signed up for public comment. I do just want to say to Kimberly Brooks that if you can hear us, we do not see you on our Zoom link. And so we'll give you a little time by giving Marshall Norsing um, the first uh, two minutes. Uh, but Kimberly Brooks, if you can hear us, if you're still watching, we are unable to see you in our um, Zoom meeting. Uh, and please note that uh, you should have received the message from Keith Glass with the link. Good. All right, Marshall, it's on you. All right. Uh, so one, I want to say, uh, when Lisa mentioned it, uh, made me feel even older. So I have been coming down here for more than 10 years before Lisa was here to these meetings on and off. Uh, and that was the most candid and the most forward looking presentation I have seen in those 10 years. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, as, and I guess the second part of that is a challenge to the board in those 10 years, uh, I have not seen any big structural changes that did not come from board leadership. I know everybody's looking to the super and or to the department heads, right? It, it's, in APS, over the last 10 years, it's come from the board leadership, whether that's out front or behind the scenes. Uh, and given the superintendent transition, that feels like where it's got to come from again. Uh, and I look forward to um, Travis telling the public about it. <laughs> and, uh, and, getting, and getting them involved. <laughs> and, uh, Is Kim back on? Yeah, she's back. Great. Um, so our next speaker will be Kimberly Brooks for um, two minutes. Ms. Brooks, can you hear us? 
Actually, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. We can. You have two sorry, minutes. I was, <laughs> I was looking at it on YouTube, and I didn't feel like I'm hogging it up on my phone. So, no, um, over the last month, no, three months, I've been dealing with two parents with a concern, and I've been addressing some issues. I sent an email um, regarding Purpose Built and some findings that I've come across. And I want to say to, with ultimate transparency that I am not only concerned and alarmed, but there is immediate action that is necessary. I did speak with Mike Davis yesterday, which was the CEO, and for maximum transparency and to shorten this, um, these systems, school, um, what is this, Slater, Price, and um, Carver, and I just see the operations being conducted as a business. These children are failing. That That's hands down. I know exactly what I'm looking at. And um, I just feel insulted to some extent by seeing this as an APS alumni, as my children, you know, having graduated and having to deal with this same issue. And it's still going on. So um, I will be in touch with the Board of Education. I will be in touch with um, this process as I look at a few things. I went to the Purpose Built meeting yesterday, the board meeting, and there's a lack of transparency, concerningly and alarmingly so, with that budget, with outcomes, with metrics of analysis of how those teachers are doing. And there's also um, two parents that I have complaining. These parents came to me unsolicited, just knowing my name and just coming to me. And these complaints are valid and they are not being addressed. They are not. Um, and I will not and they will not be pacified because these are children. So I just want to make sure that I'm transparent and that I'm open so that you know my intentions are. I love APS. I love my school. I love my students. I love them. I will love them forever. And I will fight for quality education for all children. But what I see in the Black community is disturbing and it needs immediate attention. And it's really not anything to negotiate. Um, and I just want to be transparent about that. So I will be in touch with um, the appropriate parties as it relates to those concerns of those parents and what the expectations are that right. they have. All right, Ms. Bro Ms. Brooks, thank you so much. We've reached a time boundary. We do want to make sure that we get your comments. If you could, please submit those. Uh, you can submit it through Let's Talk and we'll ensure um, that it gets to um, the board as well as to administration just so that we can address those concerns. Uh, with that being said, Madam Chair, we uh, are concluding public comment. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, public. Appreciate your feedback. Um, all right. With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Second? Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all so much.